Good afternoon. Welcome to the December 2nd City Council meeting. We will begin by convening the city's assisted housing governing board. I will call that meeting to order and ask that the clerk please call the roll. Board member DeCicio. Board member Garcia. Here. Board member Nowakowski. Here. Board member Pastor. Board member Stark. Here. Board member Waring. Here. Board member Wiesahan. Here. Board member Williams. Here. Vice Chair Guardado. Here. Chairwoman Gallego. Here. Member here too. Board Member Wiesahan, do we have a motion on the March 4th and June 24th, 2020 Assisted Housing Governing Board minutes? Board Member, can you please unmute yourself? I move that the minutes of the meetings as be approved as submitted. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? All those in favor, please signal aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Do we have a motion on our resolution? Yes, I move that uh, the motion be approved as the motion be voted on as, as submitted. I will second that motion. Any comments on the resolution? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Weza Han? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Pass is 10 0. Thank you. With that, we will adjourn the Assisted Housing Governing Board meeting. Thank you, Board Member Weza Han, for joining us. We will call to order the formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council for December 2nd, 2020. Will the clerk call the roll? Councilman DeCicio? Yes. Councilmember Garcia? Here. Councilman Nowakowski? Here. Councilwoman Pastor? Here. Councilwoman Stark? Here. Councilman Waring? Here. Councilwoman Williams? Here. Vice Mayor Guardado? Here. Mayor Gallego? Here. We have Mario Barajas with us here today to provide translation services for our Spanish, interpretation services for our Spanish residents. Mario, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Mayor. My name is Mario Barajas. I will be providing the interpret interpretation services for our Spanish speakers. I will now be introducing myself to the Spanish speakers. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Mario Barajas y yo voy a estar sirviendo como su intérprete del español. Gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Will the city clerk please read the 24 hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6703 and 6771 through 6777, S47126, 47130, 47132 through 47147, and 47151 through 47158, and resolutions 21882 through 21884. Thank you. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on Mayor and City Council Board and Commission nominations? Yes, I have a motion to approve Mayor and City Council Boards and Commissions nominations. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on our liquor license applications? 
Yes, I have a motion to approve items two through eight, noting that item nine has been withdrawn by the applicant. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business planning and zoning? Yes, Mayor. Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, motion to approve items 10 through 65, except the following items 11, 12, 13, 16, 28, 29, 32, 33, 35, 42, 62, 63, and 64. Items 25, 29, and 63 are as revised. Item 33 has additional information and excluding these items for public comment 15, 24, 30, 31, and 60. Excellent Second. motion. Second. Second. Second from Councilwoman Stark. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. We next move to payment items, beginning with item 11, Alliance for Innovation membership. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 11. Second. Any comments? Roll call. DeCicio. No. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. I apologize. Waring. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 7 1. Um, let's take items 12 and 13 together. They are related items, the dues for our U.S. Conference of Mayors and National League of Cities memberships. Uh, do we have a motion on items 12 and 13? Motion to approve items 12 and 13. Second. Second. Any comments? Roll call. DeCicio? No. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Councilman Waring? Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7 1. Uh, excuse me, oh. Mayor. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank okay, you, Councilman. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know what went on there. I, I wanted to vote no on, those, on 12 and 13. Thank you, can Vice. Can you hear me? Thank you, Council yes. Member. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Where have you been, Waring? So items 12 and 13 passed by a vote of seven to two, including Councilman Waring and those opposed. Uh, we next move to item 15, which is an automobile accident settlement. Um, do we have a motion on item 15? Motion to approve item 15. Second. We do have met one member of the public wishing to address the council on this item, Walt Garcia, or Walt Gray. Thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, this is Walt Gray, I'm a community activist on the west side. I'd like to ask for, I, as I have in the past, uh, uh, a short and brief and to the point report on item number 15. Uh, th thank you for your comment. It is an automobile accident. Uh, any council member comments? Roll call. Desicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Castor. Yes. Dark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. Next move to item 16, which is the settlement of the claim Whitaker versus City of Phoenix. Give a motion. Motion to approve item 16. Second. I'm sorry, do we have a second? Yes, Pastor. Second from Councilwoman Pastor. Uh, we do have, uh, we will turn to uh, Councilmember Garcia for comments. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to start off by reading a, a quote from Katie Ryan's sister that was in the paper this last week. How do you put a price on a human life? No amount of money will, will ever bring back my brother. And my niece and nephew not only have to live without their father, but also with the trauma of his death. Um, it was hard to read that article and know that the family spent this last holiday and will spend the, the holiday season for the first time without Ryan. Um, we not only failed this family in, in our policies, but also I feel like we failed them in being able to walk them through this process, in, in walking them through them, uh, searching for answers um, and knowing what really happened. The community, including Katie on numerous calls, um, have asked for real accountability with teeth. And instead, a couple of weeks ago, we voted down all forms of civilian oversight of police. Uh, there is nothing in place uh, to truly enforce consequences for life-threatening mistakes. We can't continue as a council to allow these incidents to happen without transparency and for this impunity to continue. Um, I just want to reflect on that and obviously give my condolences against to, to the family and thank them for their efforts, the press conferences, um, time and time again, coming before council, knowing that they have to relive that trauma over and over and that we, we failed them. Um, I'm supporting the settlement and, and again, I hope it helps the family, but I know they're their son, their husband, their, their father, the, the brother, everything that Ryan was to the community uh, won't be there anymore. And so I'm supporting the settlement, just reminding everyone of, of how tragic and, and, how much, and how much we are in need of true accountability and transparency. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Garcia. Any additional comments from council members? Uh, Mayor. Councilman DeCicio. Thank you, Mayor. My apologies to the uh, Whitaker family for what occurred here. Ryan Whitaker did everything right that night. There was nothing he did that was wrong. I know that there are some individuals that have said that he shouldn't have done certain things. He did everything correctly. He was an upstanding young man, did everything right. And to Councilman Garcia's point, no amount of money can ever replace a life, and especially an individual who was close to his family, close to his girlfriend. The amount of horror that his girlfriend had to go through while this shooting occurred is unacceptable. Uh, one of the things, and I know it changed our policy, but it, and the police chiefs heard this before and others have heard this before, the fact that we as a city did not call for immediate help, medical assistance 
for Ryan Whitaker for such an incredibly long time. We don't know if he would have lived or not, but the fact of the matter, it showed a strong callousness from those individuals that were there to not immediately call for help. That is just completely unacceptable. Um, and the police chief heard me say this before. It doesn't matter whether it's in policy or not. When you have someone that's injured, your first duty is to try to save that life. And it is so sad all the way around that what happened to this individual, his family, I cannot, I can, his girlfriend was asking, begging for medical assistance and nobody picked up the phone. Imagine that, you have an individual bleeding, still alive, in pain, in agony, bleeding out, and no one picked up the phone, no one picked up anything to make that phone call and request medical assistance immediately. I just, I just, I find that incomprehensible. I cannot even imagine somebody doing that, uh, let alone one of our employees. So this has been a tragedy all the way around. It's so sad, and I just can't imagine what the mom and dad are going through, the family members, and I, you know, I'm, and the girlfriend. I mean, the fact that the girlfriend was there watching all of this, seeing all of this, and all they were doing was they did nothing. All they were doing is enjoying their time together. They were laughing and kidding around, and then this tragedy occurred. So uh, I'm going to be supporting this. Uh, quite frankly, I think it was a low number. I think they, you should have asked for a lot more to the family. I just, I, my sincere apologies from the city of Phoenix. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Advanced Any additional counsel? Oh. We have two members of the public to address the council. We'll begin with Walt Grace, followed by Marcus. Uh, I'd like to uh, support the uh, comments by Councilman Garcia and Councilman DiCicio. I think it's particularly uh, noteworthy that Councilman DiCicio is a uh, strong and longtime advocate of the police department. And to him to step out like this and point out the truth is very noteworthy. And so I just, uh, I think Councilman DiCicio is writing that this is a low number and that I hope that future cases are brought to a more just number. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus Reed. <clears throat> I think you all should uh, vote unanimously yes on this. Uh, my condolences to the Whitaker family. Um, as a community member that um, you know, been calling in to try to get changes in the police department. Um, I feel responsible, you know, partly responsible to not be able to get through uh, to any of the elected officials, the urgency of making some changes. So, you know, um, you know once I saw the video, I it's completely, you know, changed my uh, viewpoints of the police here. And I just wanted to put my condolences out there to the Whitaker family. That's all. Thank you. That concludes our public comment. Roll call. Decisio. Decisio. Oh, sorry about that. For whatever reason, I was having a hard time getting through. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. I just. I want to make some comments. I think it's very important that we continue to push for the Office of Accountability and Transparency. Um, as there was another uh, shooting and death within my district and uh, within our city, and I feel like we, we should uh, continue to push for our Office of Accountability and Transparency. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0.
Thank you, a unanimous vote. We next move to item 24, which is amendments to the pay ordinance. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 24. Second. We have a motion and a second. We do have one member of the public to address the council, Aaron Carnine. Mayor, it appears that Aaron is not on the line. Th thank you. Do any council members have comments? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. We next move to item 28, which is a contract extension with our COVID-19 recovery consultants, helping us get expertise as we navigate public health issues. Do we have a motion? I have a motion. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, I have a motion to approve the contract extension with 2020 uh, COVID-19. I think it's exciting that we're extending the contract. However, I would like to see the health experts role to, to be that of a more proactive advisor on COVID related issues to the council. For example, I would like the health expert to proactively update council on COVID related trends, create a plan for each department with criteria on when we close down and when we reopen and an ensure and in order to ensure that this can be carried out i would like to move to add a total of 250,000 for the extension of this contract second the additional 50,000 second we have a motion and an extension i'm a motion and a second any council member comments oh, mayor Councilman Mayor, Decisio. Um, Councilman Decisio. I'm going ahead. to be supporting this. Oh, that's a thank you, Mayor. I'm supporting it, and I really like the fact that she, uh, Laura added some more things that are in there, more about being proactive. We don't have to agree on the end policy, but it's good to have people telling us things that they see happening and are able to project forward as to what they're expecting to see out there. At the end of the day, policy is our decision. You know, everyone knows I'm not favorable toward any type of shutdown or close down of our economy at all, at all. But I do believe that you do have to hear even individuals that you may not agree with, but at least you're going to have that information there. And so I want to thank Councilwoman Pastor for moving that forward. I like the idea of being able to tell us what the trends are, what we're seeing out there, rather than getting it from the national media. As, and then coming to our own conclusions on that. It's good to have people in house that are going to do that. So I'm fully supportive of this and want to thank you for doing that. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, from from the beginning of this conversation, from the beginning of the pandemic, um, I've been asking for us to have experts on board. It felt a little bit irresponsible to make a lot of the decisions we made earlier this year without having our own experts. And so I'm, I'm supportive of this. Um, I'm glad that we have an expert on board and that we can bounce ideas off and, and have those conversations. Um, I'm glad we can expand. I would like to have more clear benchmarks on how and when we reopen, making sure that that's an equitable process. Um, I'd also, Mayor, wanna, wanna have a conversation and I don't know if you can put it on a future and agenda or, or how we go about it. But I really do think um, we need to have a conversation of us having a permanent uh, public health office. Um, we're one of the only large cities that doesn't have one. Um, if this pandemic taught us anything is that public health interacts with a lot of our work and a lot of the decisions that have been led up to ourselves or to different departments, they've had to make them blindly. I know there's a, an idea or an assessment by some 
that the county uh, health department is there to support us. Um, but again, one of the things we've proven this year and don't fault them because they're taking care of their entire county and because of the pandemic, they've been so busy, they just haven't been available to us. And so I, I just wanna mark the, that I'm grateful that we went in this direction and that we have a, a public health person <clears throat> contracted with us to help us through these important decisions. But I also want to remind everyone uh, the importance of having our own public health office and the, the permanency in that to be able to move forward uh, past this pandemic and to be ready um, in case uh, something similar or something else happens. So I'd be supportive and, and thank you, Councilwoman Pastor, for, for adding more funds and, and defining the scope. Thank you, Council Member. I think we can, as we add new city departments, it is a complicated process, which we just went through recently, but would include discussions in our budget process as we move forward. It seems that public health debates are going to be with us for, for quite a while. I am glad to support this item. Recovery consultants are have been an important partner of ours as we've tried to make data-driven decisions and lead with public health first. We need to have a good scientific understanding of the best knowledge that there is about the virus. Uh, we've learned a lot during this almost one year period we have been fighting COVID, but we still have a whole lot more to learn and we appreciate having national leadership and expertise with us to make these decisions. Any additional council member comments before we vote? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. We next turn to item 29, which is review of field allocations and tournaments as revised. We uh, will begin with a brief staff update. I will uh, introduce our Deputy City Manager, Inger Erickson. Thank you. Mayor and members of the Council, today Acting Director Tracy Hall from the Parks and Recreation Department is here to provide information regarding field allocations, reservations, and tournaments for the use of sports fields in Phoenix Parks, and also to seek uh, Council guidance for upcoming and future use of sports fields in the city. Tracy. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. As Inger indicated, I am here to, today to review field allocations, reservations, and tournaments in Phoenix athletic fields. In efforts to comply with the Arizona Governor's Executive Order, athletic fields were closed on April, by April 2nd of 2020. On September 2nd, Phoenix City Council approved outdoor athletic fields to be reopened for programming, together with restrooms associated with those fields. Since that time, all athletic fields have been open for reservations, allocations, and tournaments. In September of this year, COVID-19 reports indicated that Maricopa County was in the moderate transmission category. Since reopening athletic fields, we have seen consistent use of fields. We've had over 6,000 allocations and reservations to date and have over 1,500 for December. Uh, we have not yet allocated beyond December at this time. Field allocation and reservation examples include practice and games in a variety of sports, including, but not exclusive to, baseball, soccer, football, softball, lacrosse, ultimate frisbee, rugby, cricket, and field hockey. Reservations and allocations often include lights being turned on for evening play from 6 to 10 p.m. Fees for allocations and reservations are paid in advance. Since September, we've also hosted over 37 tournaments and we have 30 additional tournaments scheduled into February of 2021. 
Tournaments are often scheduled a year in advance, and to date we have over 80 tournaments scheduled for the 2021 calendar year. Tournaments can include as few as 10, 10 teams and up to 500 teams. Deposits are required, but full fees are not collected until after the tournaments are played. Since coming to council in September, COVID trends have changed. The Arizona Department of Health Services is now reporting Maricopa County in the substantial transmission category with a percent positivity over 12%. This next chart indicates where community spread was in September versus where it was in November. When the fields were open in September, the community spread percent positivity was in the minimal range at 4.81% and the number of new cases was 29.27 per 100,000 new cases. In October, both percent positivity and new cases were in the moderate range at 5.25 positivity and 62.52 per 100,000. And as of November 8th, percent positivity reached the substantial range at 12.14% and the number of new cases increased to 221 per 100,000 new cases. Thank you, Tracy. Mayor, members of the council, we've heard many questions uh, about understanding what the medical uh, community uh, recommends related to sports tournaments, games, and practices. So to provide some insight on that question and to provide some information and perspective uh, to consider, we have on the line Dr. Popescu, who uh, uh, you just recently uh, added to her contract, the consultant that we've been using for special events um, and also in our uh, consideration of uh, opening uh, city facility. So, Dr. Popescu. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to speak before you. So, I wanted to shed some light about some of the concerns regarding tournaments and, and some of the park activities simply because what we're seeing in the United States and in Arizona is quite unprecedented. Arizona alone has seen a 69% increase over 14 days for COVID-19 cases. What we have seen since on December 1st was nearly 11,000 new cases in the state. And overall, overall in Arizona and the US, we're seeing very stressed hospital systems. And this point in the pandemic is quite concerning because of not only the holiday season, but also the winter months when people tend to move indoors. But one of the pieces that is growing concern is regarding tournaments and gatherings of people that bring large groups of people together from out of state and state, but ultimately these events where we are seeing transmission occur, we've seen a lot of cases where outbreaks occur on sports teams who opt not, not to wear masks when they're playing, but then also spectators. I'm sure you've seen, you know, the Broncos lost their four quarterbacks, but you know, what we do know is that sporting events can be quite challenging from an infectious disease standpoint. So it is highly recommended to not have tournaments right now, given the nature of the outbreak in the state and in the US, and really focus on if you are going to have local small games, they should only be occurring if there are no spectators and athletes are masked. Really, everybody is masked. There have been several studies that have shown that athletes can wear masks 100% of the time and do so safely. So I would highly recommend that when we are looking at these activities, we focus on a tiered approach being, you know, risk, um, risk mitigating. So the highest tier, the most concerning is a tournament, bringing a lot of people together below that would be games and under that would just be regular park activities. So I think right now is the time to really have a plan driven by data and approaching this from a risk reduction measure. So I'm happy to answer any questions or address specific topics if you'd like. Mayor, Thank you. Just one oh. question. Councilman DeCicio. All right, just one question to the doctor. Um, how many COVID cases are related to these? I mean, give me a number. That's something that's data driven to these uh, uh, sporting events. So there has been concern, I know, for the hockey tournaments coming in here and some of the soccer ones. I can't give you a specific number because that would be for the most part private and something that Maricopa County or ADHS would provide. I'm happy to see if that's possible, but we have seen 
outbreaks related to specific teams. So there was a hockey team recently in the U.S. that had, I think, about 20 players that tested positive. I mean, we, we do know overall, I'm sure you've seen even from professional sports, once one person gets it on a team in an environment like that, it's quite hard to mitigate the control measures. So some of this is private health information. It's, it's not public, but we do know that there have been cases on the teams, especially the hockey ones that have recently been playing. But we should have some sort of data that shows that these are a real problem. I, I haven't seen anything like that. I mean, at least not here in Maricopa County. I'd be great to point out the Broncos and the national hockey team somewhere outside of the state of Arizona. But well, I think the how many sometimes do you with see? infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry. How many do you see happening here on these teams, team sports? So we've been doing team sports for a while now. So the issue isn't just the team sports, so it's the tournaments. When you're having dozens of teams come in with athletes, with coaches and with spectators is the issue. So I'm, I'm happy to work with the local health department to see if we can get a number, but that information tends to be private until it is published online through a peer reviewed article or with the CDC. But I, well, how about I can teams? collectively say what high we have football. seen across the, across the board though, for any gathering of people is considered high risk. California put a limit on 10 people for a reason. So when we are bringing together this amount of people for tournaments, it is inherently high risk for disease transmission, especially of a respiratory pathogen like COVID-19. Well, whether it's a tournament or not, you still have a congregating group of individuals that are there. How many football teams, let's say we've got football been going on for some time now, how many of them have actually said, hey, we can't do it because our entire team here in Arizona, you can pick anywhere in Arizona, have literally stopped like their football teams. And I know that because I know how close you get when you're playing football. So I, I guess the question is, first of all, that's private health information, I'm, I'm, so we can't assume anything is happening well, or not happening no, no, no. unless football they publish teams it. have said that they're not doing this anymore. No, no, no. How many yeah. football teams have said, hey, we can't do this because there's been too much of an infection? How many football it's teams in Arizona? It's ultimately been up to the universities. Have shut and, down. Mm -hmm. Well, you have also have to ask yourself how many football teams are consulting with medical experts and public health experts, and that's been a particular gap in the protocols. So I can tell you from the public health perspective and from peers that consult with the NFL and the NBA, it's very well supported at those high levels. At the lower levels, they don't have those resources because from the beginning, events, sporting events and spectators has been high risk. So if they're playing with masks, that's another thing. My concern is with a tournament with that many people, if you can have smaller local games with masks and no spectators, that, that seems a much lower risk issue. My concern, though, is, again, the tournaments that are continuously happening when we're telling people you should be staying home and restaurants are saying we have to have a minimum capacity or maximum capacity, excuse me. So the, I think that's a, a big piece when we have all of these people congregating. It doesn't matter if they're outside. They are in close quarters, they're breathing heavily, and we're at a time in the US and in Arizona where we cannot afford additional cases stressing the public health and healthcare system. This is, in my opinion, a low hanging fruit when it comes to public health. And one that really you know, is an important thing to say that we're gonna put the public's best interest and that tournaments are high risk. Well, before we do that, we have to have the data that proves that, right? Well, ASU football was actually just shut down. So I think that's a pretty big indicator. Right. They're the only ones in the state. I was going to bring that up. So are we, I guess, are, are we saying that the decision is based off of what college football is doing instead of what the science no. and the concern what I'm for saying transmission is? is? We were tr we're trying to get the data-driven decisions, right? We can't say tournaments are a problem when everyone's abiding by the rules, pretty much. <laughs> we did that at the last tournament. Everyone did really well there. I'm just saying is so, there's the data to support all these this, these points you're making here. Multiple different entities have shut down their programs because of COVID outbreaks. So I don't know. I mean, if you're needing bodies before we act, then maybe that's your standard, no, but it certainly not be mine. I you mean, know, the that's really unfair states to say that. That's just so wrong. You've been really needling me forever now. Mayor, you need to stop. 
I'm telling you right now, you need to stop this needling. And I have a right to ask these questions, and I'm going to ask them. And as uncomfortable it may make you feel and others feel, I have a right to make these questions. So I'm Councilman, going to Councilman, I allowed you, that, I you allowed to, to ask the same question multiple times. Yeah, you are not but, asking a new question. Yeah, she has already answer. answered your question. But you need to stop, Mayor. I'm telling you that right now. It's inappropriate the way you're handling me and my questions. I have a right Councilman to do Cassisto, that. Councilman the voters ele elected me to run these meetings. If you wanted to run these meetings, you could right. have run for mayor. And you need to be done, and you need to do it politely and respectfully of everybody. Councilman DeCicio, do you have any new questions? Thank you. Nope. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor? Councilwoman. So I, I guess my um, doctor, thank you so much um, for, for being with us today. Um, I know you and I have had many meetings and many conversations in the last few days and definitely has given me um, a lot of knowledge in terms of decisions um, that, we're, that we're making and that we're gonna continue to make in the, in the next couple of months. I guess my question, um, my question to you is um, what do you, given everything that, that you've seen and everything that you're seeing around the country and in other parts of the world um, today, given our numbers, what what is your, your recommendation? Like, what do you think um, your professional advice and your recommendation is in terms of what is it that we should be doing at the parks? I think the, the first step is to not be having sports tournaments at the parks. And the second step would be if we're going to have local games, local soccer games, football games, whatever that might be, the small scale is ultimately having um, a requirement that there are masks and that there are no spectators. Now, this might be challenging, but it is an important piece. If that can't be done, then we can't have the games. We do have the literature to support, um, you know, when I was reviewing this last night, athletes wearing masks comfortably and safely. So I think that's a safe way for them to continue having games. But if not, then we probably shouldn't. For the parks, we do know that areas where people congregate is high risk. So the Ramadas, I know we had kind of spoken about that in the past couple of days. Parks are an important piece. Playgrounds are an important piece to safety, emotional well-being, and, and community right now. And we haven't seen outbreaks associated with playgrounds. You know, as long as people are staying in their households and wearing masks and distancing, that's important. But what we do know is that high risk activities and parks where people are congregating are going to be potential drivers for transmission. So I would recommend with the current cases we're seeing in Arizona and in the United States, and it's likely going to get worse with the holidays approaching that we not have tournaments and we have a masking requirement for any games that might occur at the park as well as a lack of spectators. So are you saying then that if we were to allow just local games, there be no spectators and the players need to be masked. Mm -hmm. um, and then you think that the playgrounds we could keep open for the for the children. But then again, um, should we make it a requirement for children to be wearing masks when they're like on the on the playgrounds? Yeah, I, I mean, I truly believe that the park should be a place where we're having masks and access to hand hygiene. And of course, you know, as we discussed additional disinfection and cleaning of those areas. So really any, I think the, the shorter, or I'm sorry, the more independent games are fine, as long as there's masking and no spectators. And then those playgrounds are okay because we've not seen associated outbreaks, but that's because families have mostly stayed distance and mask. And for the most part, kids are pretty good about wearing their masks. It's, it's not perfect, but as long as you know, we really make a concerted effort and communicate that to families, yes. And then in terms of, I know that we have a lot of parks where we have barbecue grills. So then um, do you, would you recommend that we, um, cause I know last time the Ramadas, everything was removed. Do you recommend that we do that again? I would simply because those are areas where people are congregating in groups. You tend to use those to come together with multiple households. So that would be an area I would consider high risk. And then how about our, our bathrooms? 
I know, I know, I, I, I didn't ask that question last time we spoke. No, I think that's a great question. Um, I, there's no reason why bathrooms need to be closed as long as people know that they should be wearing a mask at all times when they're in the bathrooms as well. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mayor. Councilwoman Pestor. Um, I have uh, lots of questions to the doctor. And one is uh, what I just heard that I hadn't heard before, but now I'm hearing it, is uh, mass at the park. Because I was at the park on Sunday, or I go to the park almost every day, uh, and people aren't wearing masks. Some are, but majority aren't because we're CDC guidelines. We're outside, we're within our own household. Um, on the playground, I can definitely tell you kids aren't wearing masks. So are you saying that we, not, you're not saying, are you recommending or you're looking at uh, having people wear masks at the park? I would say really the guidance is we know when you're outdoors and you're distanced, you don't necessarily need to be wearing a mask, but if you're going to come into close contact with people outside of your household, even if it's outside, you do need to be wearing a mask. So the CDC does recommend masks on children, you know, down to the age of two. So that is definitely, um, I would highly suggest a mask requirement for that, or at least the notion, you know, some kind of communication or education. You know, we mentioned hiking the other day that people would like to take it down when they're not when they're not any around anyone and that's fine but when you're around other people outside you need, you do need to be wearing a mask so however we can communicate that i think is the most important piece okay and this isn't a question for you this is a question for staff um, if there are mask requirements on the park who's enforcing it mayor members of the council in the parks we would depend on our park staff or our park rangers uh, to do that. However, we just have to be straight up here that we don't have enough staff in our parks or enough rangers to be able to monitor every group of people or every use of every piece of equipment or playground. So I think to the doctor's point, we would want to communicate as we have been and as we did earlier, uh, expectations of mask wearing but we would have to be clear that we cannot enforce that at all times in all parks, in all situations. So we would have to accept that as a sort of baseline fact um, from our staffing level. Well, Mayor, can I comment? Yes, please. Um, if we're, we can't enforce it, then there's going to be some dynamics or some challenges uh, regarding that. So um, I guess we'll just have a bigger discussion. See, this is why I think it's very important to have our health expert really come in and tell us what is it that we need to do to quit to try to stop the spread and have a, 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 a plan on doing that versus piecemealing this and trying to figure out, uh, we're gonna do this today and then tomorrow we're gonna do this. I think there needs to be a comprehensive plan as to what we need to do from here forward. And when we, we do the things that we do, then how do we then open up? And this is, this is where I really feel like Councilman Garcia has been head of the game in, in, in pushing for a public health expert because now we're in the situation of reacting. Um, and we're sending mixed messages to our community and to the collective as to really what we should do. So those are my comments. Council member, uh, Councilwoman Stark, followed by Council thank member you. Garcia. And um, thank you, doctor, for being here and thank you for your patience. I appreciate it. 
Um, so what I'm hearing you say, it's, it is contact. It's that contact sport, and a, a lot of these tournaments involve that. But, but it's still probably acceptable to let kids at least go out, throw a football around or a softball, and at least enjoy parks and being outside. It's just when the kids come into contact, there is a greater risk, and then they can in turn expose their parents and other adults and other children, correct? It's not just children, though. It's also the adults that are coming together for the sporting events, too. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. you know, as you mentioned, contact, it's close contact. So outdoors is a protective thing. We know it helps dilute the air and um, the virus if it's emitted in aerosols or droplets. But that close contact with athletes when they're breathing heavy can be the big issue. So that's why masking is really important. But to your question about, you know, if a couple of kids can go out to the park and throw a football around, that's an important piece right now. That that mental health, that social well-being is very important. We have not seen outbreaks associated with small things like that or playgrounds, but I think that is where some of the messaging has come in as, as we discussed previously, where if, you know, if you're not gonna have a mask mandate for the park as a whole, it really should just be, please wear a mask when you're in close contact with other people. So if you have a group of neighborhood kiddos playing, you know, touch football, they really should be wearing a mask because they're all coming together. But if it's two kids distance wearing a mask, I mean, those are the kind of nuances that I think it's so important to have that public communication with. But, um, you know, overall, parks are important areas. And I think just allowing or providing better communication about when a mask is required and when you're really encouraging masks out of safety. But tournaments right now probably are um a big risk and yes. but we could still have our parks open it's just that we'd have to communicate what you can use the parks for correct yeah yes okay. and when you. you know I, I would highly as we mentioned um the barbecues and armadas areas that's where people are gathering so that's not a good idea but right. for those smaller games as long as you're not having spectators that means parents and families and the athletes are wearing masks that becomes a lower risk thing and you know i right. think that's acceptable it has been approved by by several um, organizations, but if, if that's not something that can be achieved, then the sport would become higher risk, as we've seen in other teams and events. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Mayor, I, I have another Garcia. question. Um, Council Member Garcia, we'll go next and then we'll go to the Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and I'll, I'll be quick. Um, second, a lot of the questions that the folks have had, I, I think we all knew the second wave was coming. It, it's not shocking us. I think what's what's shocking us is that, or shocking myself, is that we weren't able to prepare ourselves to uh, to set metrics that determine what the best our best practices are going to be. And so here we are having another conversation that has politics involved in it. That has, you know, unfortunately, some tournaments that have already begun who are like in the playoffs and all these sorts of things. So, so it's bringing a lot of emotion to it that I wish we would have been able to settle with just setting numbers forward. I also want to recognize that there is fatigue, like folks are tired and our youth have been online schooling and, and my 13 year old and my four year old want to get out and want to do things. Um, and so I feel like the conversation where it's leading to is around public education. And so I did want to ask the doctor of, you know, what else can we do public education wise? Um, I, I, I think we need to do, you know, things in different languages. Um, but I, it might seem, I guess, redundant, but, but I really think that we should focus in figuring out uh, that public education piece and just wanted to ask the doctor, like, does it mean signage? Does it mean PSA? Is like, what is it that that we think is missing, especially going into this, this, we've all had fatigue now, I think for the last couple of months. And then what's more worrisome is the numbers that are gonna come after this holiday break and then going into the, the December holidays. Um, so just wondering your advice on, on that. And then I wanted to come back and have more thoughts on, on the reopening part when, when we get there. Okay, yeah, no, I appreciate the question on communication because I think that's a piece that we collectively have struggled with in the US and just public health in general. So communication and community based education is really, really important right now. I say this because it's been um, very superficial in terms of mask up, which is great, but explaining when you need to mask up versus when you cannot wear a mask um, outside if you're more than you know six feet apart. And 
the little little things that we're finding out about this pandemic is that we really need to focus on harm reduction. And that basically means I can sit here and tell you what not to do, but if I don't give you safer alternatives, <clears throat> you're, you're gonna guess on your own. So the goal for more public communication and education that I would highly recommend is not just explaining the Swiss cheese approach to COVID response, meaning nothing is perfect, but if you do them all together, they'll help reduce risk. And the other piece is, I'm not just gonna tell you, these are all things you should not do. I'm gonna give you safer alternatives. And I think that would be really, really helpful and meaningful to people and ways that we could be more proactive in how we guide, um, not just the community in their efforts, but educate them in how to make informed decisions when they're having to like critically think about, is this safe or is this not safe? It can be very stressful. So I would entirely agree to that, yeah. Okay, the, the other kind of connected question is, one of the big concerns I had when when the council voted to reopen last September was that our staff wasn't prepared. And we, we heard our city manager now saying, we just don't have the capacity to enforce masks or, or some of the things that we're gonna be talking about. And so to me at the time, if we didn't have the ability to do that, or we're even putting our staff at risk, you know, having to go up to people, talk to them, all those sorts of things, I felt it was better to just, you know, shut down because we didn't have a plan. And so with that, the question is, what are some recommendations for staff? Um, especially as, you know, it looks like we're, we're heading towards a place where at least we're canceling tournaments or we're going to, we're going to make some more restrictions, but what are some of the, the, the recommendations or, or maybe trainings or things we could do with staff to keep them, uh, safer and then also hopefully not make them also spreaders. So I think that there is definitely, I mentioned that Swiss cheese model. I think that's honestly the best educational strategy. It's not only how to wear PPE, but how to appropriately distance hand hygiene disinfection. But um, in the office spaces, how can we, you know, if people need to come and work in an office, because maybe it's just really hectic at home and they need a couple days in the office, how do we approach that? Do we have people signing up for certain days, staggering? There are ways to do it. There are data-driven protocols that can be put into place. It just takes having those conversations for sure. And another piece to this, though, is we can build a bunch of safety around the workplace, but if we're not also teaching people how to take those infection prevention measures home into the community, then we're doing them a disservice. And I think that's a huge piece to the education and communication with, with staff of this is how you're gonna be safe at work, but here's how these lessons apply at home and taking that risk reduction, that risk awareness approach because they can be so safe at work and then you know go go home and maybe they don't realize that the things they might be doing are high risk. So I think that's an important piece to it as well. Okay, and, and my, my final thoughts are on, I think as we have this conversation and make a decision today, it's important to mark when, when you know, what numbers we're gonna reopen or go back to where we were today or back to where we're in September. And one of the things I was also really disappointed last time is we used the county numbers um, to reopen, right? The, and we, the numbers we saw today, I think those are the best numbers, right? Those are the, the, the numbers that kind of tell the, the story of, of, of the entire county. But uh, some of our concerns last time we reopened was that we still had, you know, red spots or hot spots in certain parts of our district. And one thing that, I, you know, again, I'm pleading with my colleagues as well, is that when we make the decision to reopen, like if you could help us figure out a way, and I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot to figure it now, I don't know if it's by zip codes or how we do it in an equitable manner, because you know I think I, I said this to you yesterday, we are in the US, we are in a place where there's, there's inequities, right? We, we know the places that have more wealth that, than others. And as the vaccine comes, as people start getting better, we know there's certain parts of our city that are going to get the vaccine first or are going to get better first. And, and I know, because it's happened in the past, that some of the areas that we represent, whether it's South Phoenix, West Phoenix, are, are going to be the last ones to be able to get better. And so I felt, you know, one of the things that upset me the most of our previous decision is we decided to reopen with those county numbers without taking into account that there are still some of our communities who were in the red or who were really suffering. And so just any thoughts on like, do we do a zip code? And we had this conversation before, but what is the best way to reopen to make sure that it's an equitable 
way and that just because some folks in certain parts of the city are doing better, we don't hurt others. There's definitely an approach for this. You know, I mentioned before data driven protocols and that's taking a, taking the data piece another, you know, more steps forward and not just looking at three metrics, but really honing in on this. So I think that's definitely a conversation for a bigger conversation for another day, but definitely strategies that should be employed. And there's a lot of ways that we can use the information we're already getting and make it more specific um, and equitable, as you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to the vice mayor, I want to go to our city manager for a second. I think I heard a little bit differently about enforcement and, and our capabilities that we just can't do perfect enforcement, but I, I want to turn to our city manager uh, on that particular item. Mayor, thank you. Uh, I think there have been good questions asked about enforcement and, and yes, our staff does, when they see issues, they will enforce it. And as you said, the issue is perfect enforcement or, or enforcement. I, I might use the analogy of stop signs. We have thousands of stop signs in the city of Phoenix. We do not have enough police officers or staff to be at every stop sign to ensure that people stop at every stop sign all the time. We do know, however, that most that almost everyone, almost every time, does stop at a stop sign because they take the personal responsibility to abide by that regulation. But because we don't have a police officer at every stop sign, we that doesn't mean we're a failure. It means we depend on people to have listened to the communications and acted upon it, as the doctor um, was talking about, and we, we rely on compliance. But if a police officer is there, they will enforce that rule. The same would be true in our parks. Our, our park staff is really committed, and I saw last weekend a lot of resources committed to enforcement, and they were doing that as they saw it. I just wanted it to be clear that we can't guarantee that we will be able to get everybody at every park, every time, complying with the rules. It's just physically not possible. But it doesn't mean that the rule isn't a correct one, that we shouldn't have it, or that it shouldn't be communicated. So thank you for that. letting me clarify that, Mayor. Thank you to our city manager. I believe that people in this community want to keep their families safe and healthy. They want to follow what is the best practices in science, and, and we can be helpful in making sure people understand what we've learned. We have learned a lot since COVID began. We have to update our policies as we learn and as situations change. But people in our community want to protect their families. Vice Mayor, thank you for your patience. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I guess, so my question is, you know, let, let's say that we allowed, you know, like kids to come in and, you know, local games to happen. Like, how do, and, 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 I get, and again, I guess it goes back to enforcement and I guess Ed in some ways answered that question. How do we make sure that these like small leagues are gonna have masks? You know, like who's responsible for for making sure that kid is gonna continue? I don't know. It just feels a little just complic. That piece feels just complicated because I mean, at least out in in West in West Phoenix, I I think it's been um, for myself. It's been a little troublesome, like driving through some of these parks and seeing that no one is social distancing and, and the huge gatherings and and seeing how people like are are coming together like you know in a perfect world I, I not a perfect world but even in an ideal world I think that um people would be wearing a mask and they would be social distancing like I I think that's a I I think it is a it is a big issue I think um the enforcement is is a big issue for me. Like I think that's, you know, part of the reason why a lot of my, um, you know, my zip codes, I think never, I probably never even left the red. I think they're still red, and they were red, and I think they're red, you know, just because of, you know, um, you know, it's low low income areas. People have to go out and work, and they have to expose themselves, and a lot of people don't know how to protect themselves. Um, but I, I'm just not exactly sure. How do we then? How how do we then flatten the numbers if we know that there's, you know, I'm sure there's parts where folks will enforce it, but we're, we we also have a lot of parts where people where people just won't do it. Um, 
So I guess like, how do we then deal with that? I don't, I don't know, doctor, if you have any ideas on how do we, like who enforces that or how do we enforce that? Like, or how do we, is it just signage? Is it messaging? Like, how do we, how do we deal with that? Because I just feel that, especially with children, it's, it's just a hard, it's really hard to get them to wear their masks. I think enforcement is a particularly challenging piece to any public health guidance. One thing that we have learned is when we communicate, especially in this case, the teams to the parents about um, this is what's needed to make this safe. If we can't follow those rules and abide by them, then we might have to backpedal and we might not to have to have these games. And it's really going to be closely monitoring the data and the compliance with that. So personally, I think if there are concerns about compliance and it can't be done, then it can't be done. If we, you know, think that the teams and, you know, the, the players and the parents are going to take it seriously and we can encourage compliance and monitor that, then I think communicating to them, look, we're going to, we're going to try and go about this in a safer way. And if we can't do it and the, you know, we're just not seeing great compliance and we might have to cancel the games. You know, I, I prefer to give people the opportunity be, to be compliant and explain to them the risks and why these decisions are being made and, and, you know, allow some of these smaller games to occur with the safety measures in place. But if they can't happen, then, then the game shouldn't be happening. Thank you. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, I just really want to thank our parks and and the director and even um, Inger was out there on a four day weekend, really making sure that um, the tournament turned out good. So I just really want to thank you all for doing that. The other thing is I had some concerns. I, as I listened, um, we heard that there's 37 tournaments that already happened. And we're talking about from now until February, there's another 30 tournaments that are go going to happen. And then I heard that from November 8th all the way back to when we opened up the park, it's increased by 69%. So we're not in the moderate um, areas anymore. So my concern is as a council member, when are we going to get informed that, you know, hey, it's it's past that moderate level. We should take some considerations in, in either closing the parks down or stopping the tournaments are getting some recommendations, right? So I'm not trying to put it all on you, doctor, but I think that um, one of the things is we had a council meeting on the, the 18th of November, and, and according to the slide on the 9th, 8th of November, we knew that it was increasing, right? So now that we know all this information, um, how many of those 30 tournaments are from outside the, the state of Arizona, where we're bringing people from New Mexico, California, and different parts of the country into, into Phoenix and how many of them are actually um, local tournaments. And when we talk about local tournaments, are they a lot of people coming together over a thousand? Are we talking about a couple hundred? And if I can get some clarification on that. Mayor, Councilman, yes. Um, the 30 per tournaments scheduled between December 2020 and February 2021 there are 3,984 teams total, and 1,849 of those would be from out of state. And um, that's kind of broad, like out of the 30, is how many of them are small tournaments? I mean, if you're gonna have like five teams come together for a little tournament, uh, that's different from having 100 teams coming in for a tournament. Do we actually know the type of numbers? Yes. Oh. Mayor, Councilman, in December, we have tournaments that uh, range from 200 teams. We have one with 25 teams, one with 30 teams, one with 15 teams, and um, one with 230 teams, one with 47, one with 40, and then the last one in December would be a 500-team tournament. And so the um, numbers of out-of-state teams range between the numbers of um, total teams. So from those, all those numbers you just read off, how many of those are out-of-state or they have participation from individuals out-of-state? Is it the 500 and the 200 and the 235 or? Mayor, Councilman, 
all but one of the, the tournaments I noted has teams from out of state. Some are the smallest being five teams, the largest being 400 teams from out of state. Yeah, so now, doctor, having that information and seeing that there is an increase, what is your recommendation? You know, as us as lay people <laughs> coming into this, you know, that's why um, I, I believe Council Member Garcia said that we needed some expertise and that's why we're leaning towards you to tell us what we should do, right? Yeah, so um, if we're looking at tournaments, of course, it's always higher risk to be having people from out of state come in. But at the same time, you know, if they're coming in from a state with lower prevalence of COVID-19 and they're coming here and we're higher prevalence, we're posing a risk to them. So right. that's that's a huge concern. But also, even if we're talking about just Arizona tournaments, it's still groups of people coming together. So I try not to get us fixated on if these are local or out of state. Obviously, out of state means more people. So that's concerning larger tournaments. But at the same time, the issue with the tournaments is all of these people coming together, all of these teams playing, and just that continued close contact and likely exposures. Okay. You know, when I voted on this back in September, I was really looking at local teams, you know, like Pop Warner football and soccer teams that have their own little tournaments here locally. I never thought we were going to, it was basically for people from all over the country, right? So that's one of the concerns I have is that we can actually be bringing in the virus from other other cities and other states, right? And and I'm not sure that maybe we should look into maybe something more local than than out of the state. And I also think that um, our staff has been doing a pretty good job. I've been going out to the different parks and seeing that the people on the field aren't wearing masks, but the people that are uh, off the field, the players and also their family members are are all wearing masks and those people that aren't wearing masks, our, our rangers are going out there to ask them to please put the mask on. And if they don't have it, they actually have a couple masks that they hand out to those individuals. So I believe our staff's trying to do as best as they can. I think that we should probably give them the resources that they need. If we have some extra masks or boxes of masks, if somebody happens not to be wearing a mask, politely give them a mask. And if they don't wanna wear it, then maybe we need to kick them off the fields for not obeying the rules. But doctor, how many of these tournaments were you actually consulted in and basically um, you kind of gave the green light to or not? Not involved in the discussion about tournaments. It was just generalized park safety. Okay, thank you. Thank you. What I would propose is that we put a motion on the table and then we have significant numbers of the public who would like to weigh in on this item, including some leaders from our healthcare system. Um, so one option is we could go to uh, the, uh, our expert again and try, or if, if anyone is ready with a motion, we could try to put that on the table. Mayor, I'm ready with a motion. Please, Vice Mayor. Okay, I would like to make a motion to cancel all field allocations and reservations effective December 3rd, 2020. I would include closing of park Ramada, Ramadas in areas of high volume, leaving open our playgrounds and restrooms with our parks department working with cons consultation from our public health expert at educating residents on CDC guidelines and best practice when utilizing our parks. This includes bilingual signage, public education, and keeping our park staff versed in these guidelines and not allowing these restricted uses until benchmarks in Phoenix return to September 6 levels. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Second. Second from Council Member Garcia. All right, um, and we had uh, significant members of the public as well write in on our council system. Uh, it, um, the comment system was imperfect in this case because there was an A and B option and we just gave support opposed no position. But we had 95 uh, comments in support, 72 in opposition, 19 who provided general feedback but not a position and two that were neutral. And we have uh, multiple members of the public who are here to address us. Uh, we will begin 
with Dr. Marjorie Bessel, followed by Anne Marie Almadeen. Um, thank you, Mayor. This is Dr. Bessel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Banner Health is the largest healthcare provider in the state of Arizona, and our headquarters are in the city of Phoenix. We are strongly in support of option B for agenda item 29. We have over 50,000 employees. Banner University Medical Center Phoenix is a quaternary academic facility, and Banner Australia Medical Center is a community hospital. Both are located in Phoenix. Both have provided care to a large portion of COVID patients in the state of Arizona. I am the Chief Clinical Officer for Banner Health and my corporate office is also in Phoenix. I am a physician. The surge of COVID is absolutely upon us as you have been discussing and getting worse every single day. For our own healthcare system, COVID hospitalizations have increased by 93% during the month of November. ICU bed occupancy increased by 50% during November. In ICU, COVID patients now occupy 50% of our ICU beds when they were only 25% on November 1st. The increase in ICU demand is driven by COVID patients. Ventilator use has increased by 120% driven mainly by COVID patients. COVID patients now account for 28% of all hospitalized patients. For Arizona specifically, we anticipate extended surge capacity above 100% of licensed beds by December 9th and we expect to remain above that level for most of December. In January, we expect to pierce through 125% of capacity for licensed beds, and this oversaturation will significantly stress our system. Hospital capacity over 100% places strain and potential delays for patients with COVID to get the most timely care they need. When above 125%, the healthcare system will have even more strain and more cause of delay in care for both COVID and non-COVID patients. Patients needing essential surgeries become delayed. Clinics may close so staff can come to the hospital to assess, thereby delaying preventative and other ambulatory care needs. The entire healthcare needs in our community face more risk when capacity exceeds 100%. This clearly paints a very good picture. We support option B, as you have been discussing. To get through the second surge, we need everybody's help. A vaccine is on the horizon and life will not be like this forever. Community endurance is needed for this last push. Option B is needed for us as the largest healthcare delivery system in the state of Arizona. It's needed to preserve capacity for both COVID and non-COVID patients who will need us this winter. Please do not add additional risk to our healthcare system that is already facing a dire situation of strain from a pandemic with uncontrolled spread. On behalf of Banner Health, the largest healthcare provider in the state of Arizona with over 50,000 employees, Thank you for your time and support of option B and the motion on the table. Thank you, Dr. Bessel. We will go to Anne Marie next, followed by Nicole Lang. Thank you, Mayor Gallego and City Council for allowing me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. I concur with Dr. Bessel that option B is what the Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association is in support of. And I come today as the CEO of ASHA, representing over 70 hospitals across the state of Arizona, but I also come as a mom, as a third generation Arizonan and Phoenician and a daughter of two elderly parents that I've kept um, isolated uh, to protect them from this insidious virus. So as we all know, we're in the middle of this surge um, and patients are dying at an alarming rate. At area hospitals, we watched the rates rise in early November. We saw hospitalizations ex escalate through the month and we are nearing capacity almost every day. Today, capacity in Phoenix is around 90% occupied and we need to maintain critical capacity for those patients who need care. Our doctors, nurses, and clinical teams are on the front lines every day they put themselves at risk to care for the most vulnerable and complex patients. They are in impossible situations every day, and I believe that they will carry this experience with them for years to come. Our patients are sick and too often dying, leaving grieving families behind who are not able to be with their loved one at the end of their life. We appreciate the city having this conversation about the steps that can be taken to mitigate this resurgence as we wait for this vaccine that is so close. 
you are doing your job trying to protect the public health and safety of Phoenicians in this city. And we appreciate that. There are three areas um, from Maricopa County where we see contact tracing showing that there is spread. Bars, restaurants, um, and, and school sports. And I believe that um, we can get data with respect to this contact tracing. So you have in your ability today to stop one of those crucial areas of spread, which is school sports, which is why we're in support of option B. I will commit that I will do all that I can to support the city in advocating for this appropriate position. Um, and I just hope that we can help really change the trajectory of this pandemic. If we don't take action today, the crisis will grow and result in more unnecessary deaths and illnesses. We do not want to get to a hospital capacity and a hospital and healthcare system that is overwhelmed. Thank you. We don't want to ration care. Thank you for Thank you for that important testimony. We will go next to Nicole Lang, followed by Mary Conant. Hello, my name is Nicole Lane, and I'm in District 1 on the boundary of Phoenix and Glendale. My son Griffin plays for Phoenix Rising uh, Soccer Club in Anthem and our home field Opportunity Way Park in Anthem. After listening to everyone, I, I mean, it's been very educational. Thank you for having me. Um, I just feel like, can I ask if we all take a step back and take a breath? I feel like we shouldn't be battling. We should all be working together. Um, I have to admit, it, it appears a little stacked. Um, many comments surged as of this morning on, co on the comments um, supporting it. And thousands of players are being affected by one main recommendation and then a couple others, you know, that we just heard of. I think we all can agree that we want what's best for our kids every day and always. I feel like we should take a look at the subject and not group the state, Maricopa County and all Phoenix cases into one basket. As we, as we uh, said mentioned, one size does not fit all. And I feel like we shouldn't be as drastic and hasty. Uh, if we've learned anything from recent reporting, uh, it's that uh, Dr. Fauci even came out recently and said the spread among children and from children is not very big at all. I actually dug into a little research from uh, reported cases from school. Total cases reported by schools versus student staff ratio is less than 1%. Total cases reported by schools versus all of Maricopa County reported is only 1% of cases. Elementary and grade schools, majority are reporting in under 1%. Unified school districts are reporting in 1%. Factor in high school cases versus total unified school district reported cases, that jumps to 42%. So to Councilman Garcia's comment about education, I think it could, we could, pour resources and energy into educating the high school kids and those a little older that are frequenting bars and nightclubs. It's not necessarily our kids. Physical activity has been so important to the physical and social and emotional well-being of my child and all the other families who have chosen to play soccer or any other sport. I know that the ASA, the Arizona Soccer Association, and all the clubs within the organization have proven their commitment and have been following the guidelines and taking extra precautions. We are distancing on the field. We've gotten separate chairs for our children to sit on the sidelines when they are not in playing in the game. We've gone over and above to make sure that we do all what we can to make our kids continue to play in their games and their tournaments. We urge you to keep the city parks and fields open for organized sports to reserve and use for competitions. Some kids are back to virtual learning and if you take their sports away and we go back to square one, that could be devastating. I personally know some children that were having severe emotional breakdowns prior to school and sports reopening. In addition to our children's emotional well-being, being able to participate as a family is just as important. With that Thank said, you. if we can can I just say one more thing? Yeah, final if, if you can give us your final thought. If we cannot remain status quo, I urge the council to come to a compromise within the three options on the table. Option A would allow spectators or at a minimum parents and guardians. Some of these children are five years old. Um, we get their family activity. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will go to Mary next, followed by Micah Coleman. 
Thank you, Mayor. I am a resident of the Phoenix community of Ahwatukee for over 30 years, and I have two children who are now college graduates who, while growing up, played youth sports, specifically softball and competitive baseball and dance. I understand the youth sport culture and the competitive drive that families and players feel regarding participation in tournaments to get exposure and to get better. The youth sports activities were not only a social event for my children, but they were a social event for the parents as well. I would have you consider that allowing tournaments, for example, large gatherings of teams from throughout our state and out of state have other consequences than just what happens on the field. Um, I understand, you know, wanting your child to play with their friends. Um, that was a real important part of my kids' life while they were growing up. When we would gather in out-of-state tournaments, for example, we would always stay at the same hotel. We would congregate as a team. We would have meals together afterwards. Each team is a group of at least 30 people sometimes up to 50 people if both parents would attend as well. Um, these types of events, social or the, the sports events have great value in young people's lives. But in my opinion, our city government should step up and put in place guidelines and restrictions on our public use space that protect the citizens of our community, even though it would affect our sports community for a short time. I believe it would be irresponsible to do otherwise. Taking guidance from the Arizona Department of Health Services with regard to projections for COVID community spread in the following months, it is not unrealistic to expect a plan to be put in place such as what is presented in this agenda item. Every state in the U.S. is projecting a terrible increase in COVID infections. We experienced a jump in COVID cases three weeks after our November election day we're experiencing another large increase now after Thanksgiving, both occasions where well-meaning people gathered and unfortunately, despite their best efforts, transmitted the coronavirus at alarm, alarming levels. I feel it is responsible of the city to act now by putting in place at least the Park and Recreation Department's Proposal A, restricting field use to no spectators and no out-of-state participants through February 2021, or by being more proactive and implementing Proposal B, restricting all field use altogether until our COVID levels decrease back to at least moderate levels throughout our county. It is hard to make decisions that are for the community good, but disappoint a lot of people, especially Thank our you. children. If we all work together, we can beat this virus. I commend the city of Phoenix for not always taking the easy route but doing what's right for its citizens. Thank you, Mayor and Council for your time. Thank you for your testimony and your involvement in our community. We will go next to Micah, followed by Christina Jung. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council for allowing me to speak today. Um, this is twofold for me. Not only do I live in Phoenix and I coach a club team here, but I'm a father of two boys and this is where it comes. It affects me personally. My 12 years, my 12 year old son has been diagnosed clinically depressed. He has been suicidal and he is now on medication and seeing counseling two to three times a week. I urge you guys before you close parks, please. I am all about option a look at how much our youth is being affected by not being able to go out and see their friends and play baseball. With that being said, I do coach baseball. We have almost 100 kids in our organization. No one in our organization has been affected by COVID. They have been, anybody that has come in contact through school, we have them um, do the CDC guidelines. 14 days, they're not allowed to practice with us. Not only that, if you come to our practices, which we practice at all City of Phoenix fields, all our players wear masks and we keep them beyond six feet apart. So not only are they wearing a mask at all times, but we have them social distancing. And again, we have almost 100 kids in our program and nobody has contacted or got corona within our organization. But before you guys choose, and it sounds like you guys are going with option B, I urge you guys to look at the mental health 
and how much it's affecting our youth. It took me four days, 48 phone calls, and 112 emails to find a counselor for my son. That is a lot of time. And all my emails and all the responses back was they were just inundated. They're, they're booked. They're, they can't see adolescents. So please, before you decide and shut it down, think about the mental health for our youth. Because a lot of these kids are now back at school online, and their only time seeing friends is on a field. Thank you for my. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for that testimony. We will uh, next go. Let's see, to Christina Jung, followed by Rosa Pastrana. Hello, my name is Christina. Christina Jung, I'm a Latina grandmother of children who love their sports. And um, they are in uh, soccer, and soccer is an integrated part of the Latino culture. And I think that all of you, so many of you who are Latinos, know how important it is not only for the children, but also for the family. These sports take, uh, get, are outside. The infection rate is very low, specifically for kids. You know, there has been talking about numbers, there has been only nine deaths in all of the COVID time here in Arizona of the ages of one to 20. So it is very low. And you know, recuperation is 99.9% .9 for children and for adults is 99.5%. So, you know, it is not the thing that is going to kill a lot of people, but it is killing the kids that cannot have any continuity in something that seems to be a normalcy that they have not had for a whole year. I follow the same as this uh, gentleman that was talking. I know of three kids that committed suicide and other ones that have to be, that don't know what to do. The, the parents don't know what to do with them because they feel that, you know, nothing is normal. So they turn into alcohol, drugs, or guns, and you know where that takes them to. And these numbers are much higher than the kids that are killed by COVID-19. Please take a look at that. Our children need to be normal, to have a life, to be able to be with their friends, to think that this craziness that has gone for a whole year is ending and that there is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. You know, it is uh, emotionally, uh, they have been abused at home, many of them, because first of all, they're with families whose parents are in alcohol or drugs. So that also has increased tremendously the abuse of children at home. And sport for them is an outing. It's something that gives, you know, is for their spirit, for their lives. Don't take away from them this ability. It is extremely important. Okay, please. And you Latinos, all of you are Latinos, you know how important this is. This is part of our lives, part of the children's lives. Thank you for that testimony. We will next go to Rosa, followed by Brent Kleinman. And I think Rosa may be calling through the Spanish line. Uh, sí, señora, la escuchamos. Okay, hola, mi nombre es Rosa Pastrana, desde Arco, Guadua, con la área de Distrito 4. Hello, my name is eh, Rosa Pastrano, in District 4. Pastrana. Pastrana. My community has been very affected by COVID. I understand the impact uh, in soccer, how it can affect soccer and the kids. But I don't think that it's a priority right now with as far as the games, because yesterday the statistics, they went up to 10,000. I feel that we need to protect our kids. I feel that our community here is limited here in the city of Maryville. I also, I also want to mention that I do have two daughters that work in hospitals. They did study medicine. 
one works with the elderly. And the other one works at a hospital. They tend to different types of people with different types of illnesses. And since March uh, till this day, um, because of COVID, they haven't been able to come home, give me a hug. They just, uh, as soon as they come in through the door, they take off the shoes and they, t they take off uh, their clothing. Uh, to this day, I've only been to these uh, small gatherings where um, a maximum 30 people were six feet apart and were out there in the fields, uh, but we have our distancing, we have our own chairs with our masks and even our gloves. And yes, uh, it is true what people have uh, been saying right now, as far as kids, uh, the importance of being having their activities. But we've gone through nine months of this already, and roughly that's what it's been. And we've pretty much we've uh, gotten into that rhythm in life, and uh, it's just something that uh, we're still having to deal with. Thank you. We will next go to Brent, followed by Jason Stringfield. Brent, the floor is yours. I wanted to um, reach out and speak on this because I, I believe there is a definite issue in how we handle these tournaments and teams coming in from out of state. and I am fully in support of canceling those events until we get this under control in some manner or some mean. But my my only fear, and I'm not even sure it's fully supporting recommendation A, but I, I, I would ask the council and the parks department if there is any way to post at least team practices or some events where they there could be proper mitigation mask wearing distancing being outside so kids could get onto these city parks because unfortunately a lot of a lot of our youth live in neighborhoods where they really don't have anywhere to go out safely if it isn't to a city park to to meet with an organized team and i i, I would like to think and hope that there is something in between canceling everything and doing some small aspects safely. And I would just ask you all before you pass this measure to reconsider and allow the parks departments to possibly maintain reservations for teams and um, very small group gatherings, maybe no games, but simply practices where once a week, because you're hearing the stories of so many of these children that aren't able in the parents of these children who see depression in their kids and all these problems. And there, there's got to be a way the city just doesn't forbid these activities, but allows for some semblance of safe activity and being outside and being on the grass. I think there is the manner in which that can be done. And I implore the council to look at this a little bit closer before you vote. Thank you very much. Thank you for that testimony. We'll go to Jason and then our final comment will be from Hameen West. Hi, thank you, Mayor and Council members for your time today. 
I'm speaking in regards to the decision on Phoenix Parks. As a board member with Scottsdale Cal Ripken Baseball, we use several city of Phoenix fields. Over the past three months, our league has had a great time getting back to baseball. Using the recommended safeguards and precautions, our season has gone on without any issues. With approximately 900 players participating, we had less than five COVID-19 cases reported to us, all on different teams. To minimize potential spread, those impacted teams were shut down for 10 calendar days from the most recent team activity. With those cases, there was zero spread to other players on those teams. We are requiring spectators to spread out while attending games and wear masks when not distancing outside of their family units. Coaches are wearing masks while on the field and players are kept apart while participating in games and practices. Umpires are also wearing masks as well, as all of these are part of the county and city guidelines. Please take these comments into consideration when making your decision today on the two choices. While it would be unfortunate for teams and players from outside of Arizona to participate, taking away the fields from local families would be a terrible experience for those that want to play. Option A would still allow local players the opportunity to play at their choice and by not allowing spectators limit potential spread. As the doctor has said, we need to look at the data and based on this, I feel that, that supports that in option A. Thank you very much. Thank you and we will go for our final comment on this agenda item. Hello, my name is Jamin West and I live here in Phoenix. I have lived in this town my whole life, 40 years. I've raised all four of my kids here. All my kids have played sports in one aspect or another. I, me and my family, we are asking you to fully support option A. I know kids these days have had no sense of normalcy. My son didn't have a high school graduation. Uh, many kids have missed birthdays and being able to hang out with friends. Being able to go back and play sports has been a huge uplifting for the kids. Having these kids being able to go see their friends on the field and have some sense of normalcy during this time, whereas their parents get to leave and go to work, but they're stuck at home all the time. It's messing with the kids' mental health. There's been kids on my children's teams that have quit playing the sport that they loved so much just because the COVID and they were cooped up in their house for six weeks and they weren't allowed to go do anything. My wife is a pediatric ER nurse here in town. She understands and she sees both sides of it. So she understands that letting kids go out and play as long as your teams are implementing what the CDC is asking you to do. And I know personally, our soccer club, the kids wear masks to and from the field. The coach limits how much close time the girls are having together. The coach is wearing a mask the whole time. When parents are on the sidelines, if they have to be closer, they're, they're wearing masks at the same time. But when you come to practice and you see us, we're sitting all spread apart. We're following the guidelines. And I think if there's no data to show and support that these tournaments are what is causing more cases in this town, then I think you're just trying to put a Band-Aid on something that you don't need to. This isn't necessary to do and punish the kids feel that you need to do. But you guys do option and let the kids still play. Thank you so much for that testimony. That concludes our public comment. Council members. Mayor, <coughs> Mayor. Councilwoman Williams. Could you have the motion repeated, please? Vice Mayor, could you, would you, or would you, I guess, would the city clerk probably, maybe we'll have the turn to the city clerk to share the motion? <coughs> That's fine. Mayor, Thank you. this is the city clerk. The motion was made by Vice Mayor Guardado and seconded by Council Member Garcia to cancel all field allocations and reservations effective December 3rd, 2020, including crossing, sorry, closing ramadas and areas of high volume to keep playgrounds and restrooms open, educate residents on best practices, including having bilingual signage and public education, and not allow the restricted uses until benchmarks are back to the December 6th levels. Sorry, September 6th levels. That doesn't have an inmate, does it? It, it does. It's when we return to September 6th levels. 
I mean, we would so, go back and revisit once we got to the September 6th levels. So it would be driven by the virus, not the calendar. Correct. And Councilwoman uh, Stark and then Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you. So we're not closing the parks. We're just closing down the tournaments and reservations for the fields. But children, their parents, they're welcome to go to our parks and get exercise. Um, and I think that's the way the vice mayor's motion reads. It's more about the tournament organized um, activity, correct? That that was the that was the intention that we're not shutting down the park, you right. know, like if if a family, you know, if dad says, you know what, let's go throw the football, we can find a little area at the park, you know, or let's play some T ball, wanna continue to keep some of the kids right. practicing T ball and mom and dad wanna take the kids to the park, um, that's one hundred percent allowable once they're wearing masks. Right. If other people are around, right? I think that's that's right. a part of the education that we're gonna have to do with folks is that we right. wanna make sure if you if you're at the park and there's other people around that you're that people continue to wear their masks even though they're outdoors. But if they wanna go throw a ball, if they wanna take the kids to go run some laps around around the park, that's all one hundred percent um doable. Right. Um, but what we're saying is that we're avoiding the massive gatherings right, right now. So children can still get exercise. They can be outdoor. They can release some of their stress. And I know we're all living under a lot of stress, but there are still those opportunities that will be afforded to children and their and their parents and families. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor followed by Councilman Nowakowski. Can I have some clarification on uh, areas of high volume? What does that mean? Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, that's thank you for asking that question. Uh, Inger and Tracy and I were just talking about that. So uh, I think Inger will clarify what, what we interpret that to mean and make sure that that complies with what is intended. Uh, Mayor and uh, Councilwoman uh, Pastor, so it would be things like the basketball um, uh, situation, uh, the sports complexes that have basketball and tennis uh, and pickleball, um, those gathering places where you see uh, lots of individuals together. Um, basically, it would be everything that we added back in with the exception of then playgrounds would still be okay and restrooms. So we'd be going back to what we uh, were doing before with the exception of playgrounds and restrooms being now still open. Can I ask one more question? Please do. So when I, I spoke to the doctor, she said pickleball, tennis, and golf were fine activity to continue. Yeah, mayor, members of the council, the only reason those two sports complexes would have those kind of situations is because you can't close off just the just, basketball and just yeah. the volleyball in those two sports complexes. It's very difficult. So in, re in regular parks where there's one or two uh, courts, those things would uh, still stay open for pickleball and for uh, tennis, but the basketball, because again, when you're playing, you're in close proximity to each other, those things would be the things that we would close uh, back. If you remember, we never closed tennis courts. Okay, so tennis courts, pickleball, golf, Will we remain open? Other than the sports complexes, which are Rose Mofford okay. and Encanto. Okay, got it. I don't know what's happening. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. So, Mayor, we have about 185 flatland parks, and we don't really have the resources to to staff all those parks, especially the soccer fields, baseball fields, um, with the staff that we have now. That's a concern of mine, because I know that before September, we were getting calls from my office saying that people were on the fields, 
Um, can you control that? And it was just very hard for us to have all those Rangers go out there and kind of control those individuals playing without our permission. So that's my concern is how do we staff that? And then second is what type of enforcement are we gonna have? Are we gonna have a warning the first time, maybe the second time, but they continue to use the field without our permission, what's gonna happen to those individuals? Um, because I know that there's a lot of individuals that have created their own like soccer leagues and that they've already are in that process and they'll, they'll just continue to play on our fields. So I know that the warnings might help out for the first couple times, but if they continue to do that, what type of enforcement we're gonna have? Uh, could somebody answer that? Mayor, Councilman, in terms of enforcement, uh, you are correct as we don't have staff stationed at many of the parks all of the time. However, we do have rovers in addition to rangers and our parks recreation staff that are, at, that are on alternate work assignments to help us educate the public when our facilities are closed. And so that is what we would look to do again. Um, we would always lead with education and uh, educate on the rules of requiring or requesting to wear masks and things of that nature. If people don't um, comply, we can look at further enforcement. In addition, if they are an organized team, it could impact their ability to future reserve if they are not complying with the rules that we have set forth um, for the parks under the, the pandemic restrictions. You know, in the future, I would like to have something in writing where we educate them one, two, three, four times or how many times you think it's appropriate and what happens after that. Because I think people need to understand if there's a type of enforcement, what that enforcement is. This way they know that after that warning, they better watch out because they're gonna, there's gonna be some consequences. The other thing is I like to make a friendly amendment that um, I believe that we have these consultants. So my friendly amendment would be that on a weekly basis, we get a report of the state of the city um, from our consultants to let us govern by by data on a, on a daily basis. So at least on a weekly basis, we get a report from the consultants that we hired for our COVID-19 consultants and that they basically tell us that our airport, this are some recommendations that we make, here's what we make for the parks, et cetera, et cetera, because we operate many different uh, facilities, many different areas, and I'd like to make sure that we can add that in there so we can actually use our consultants to the fullest and that this way we can look at the data on a weekly basis and this way it helps us to make these decisions. So I'm not sure if the maker of the motion will allow that to be in there that we actually recommend that the council get a weekly report of the state of the city um, from the COVID um, consultants that we hired. Well, actually, before we go to the vice mayor, maybe we could go to city management about the um, existing reports. Uh, and maybe if the city manager could talk about what uh, the communications office is reporting and if there might be ways to make sure Councilman Nowakowski were responsive to his desire for data. And Mayor, I've been getting the um, the state and the county um, information on a daily basis, but that's really basically the state and the county. And we have experts that are geared towards the city of Phoenix. So like Councilman Garcia said, we need to have our own person that's geared towards the city of Phoenix and all that information from the county and from the state's great, but I think we need to dig a little bit deeper and we need to focus on our own um, situation in the city of Phoenix. Uh, Mayor, Councilman hey, Nokow Mayor and Councilman Nokowski, so my intention would be that the um, benchmarks that the vice mayor included as the triggers in her motion, those would be benchmarks that we would update to the council on a weekly basis, those benchmarks come from the Arizona Department of Health Services, and so we would keep those uh, top of mind uh, to the council every week on a weekly basis. We will work with the um, with our consultants to determine what what they are able to do for us, how how um, how much farther into it we can get with them on on a weekly basis, and I will get that report back to the council uh, a week from. Uh, next week 
Uh, so we'll, we'll make it clear what it is we're able to do in addition to the reporting that we have been doing already. I just can't speak to what that can be exactly at, at this time. Um, we'll, we'll talk with her though about that. Thank you. Mayor, um, city manager, may I ask a question? Please do. Uh, thank you. So I agree with you 100%. I mean, we've been getting information from the state level and the county level on a daily basis. What I like to see is the individuals that we've contracted to really look at those high traveled or high impacted areas. Um, for example, the airport, right? We were on the news for the airport. Then maybe they can actually look at that area in, in the future. If we open up the convention center within the next six months, then they can look at recommendations for the convention center. And if there's areas in our city that we have other programs going on that they can actually give us advice because if we knew that on November 9th that there was an increase, I would have loved to have that information for that following council meeting so we can actually have this conversation sooner. So I believe yeah. that we need to operate through data and that would be the best way of doing it using our own expertise, right? Mayor Councilman Nokowski, yes, uh, thank you for that clarification. Definitely, as we get to uh, areas like the convention center reopening, the contract you all just approved, thank you, will allow us to uh, use the, those consultants to give us advice on that. So that will definitely uh, be part of that and we'll continue to work with them about what more information we can provide to the council. Uh, one clarification on that, the, um, the metrics that we included, and it was originally on page 152 of the agenda and then was, uh, actually updated yesterday. The, the date of that is um, a little misleading because though that is the latest date that we have. So the latest information from Arizona Department of Health Services is data that they put together from the week of November 8th, but we only received that information last Thursday. Tomorrow, we will receive from Arizona Department of Health Services updated information every Thursday. So tomorrow we will receive it and it will be for, the, it will show it as the week of November 15th, but it is in fact the latest data that we have possible. So I just wanted to make it clear. I don't think we, we clarified that at the beginning. Okay, right. Mary, I have a follow up question. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so what concerns me is that we have hired some consultants that are experts and when I asked the question about were they involved with the planning of these tournaments and giving permission for these tournaments to operate in the city of Phoenix, um, they weren't involved with that process. So I would like to see that something where there's uh, more than 50 people gathering, that they have some input so that we as, as the council members can read that data, that information, and, and this way we can make a clear decision uh, of our future votes. So that was really concerning and alarming. And that's why I wanted basically to put it on the record that um, that we get a weekly report because otherwise um, it would go on for months and we wouldn't ha understand what's really happening. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Waring, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, if, if Tracy's there, I did have a, a question or two for her. Um, the motion as presented is canceling the tournaments. So if you're coming from out of state for a tournament, you're no longer, there's no tournament to come to now, correct? We just can't, or we're gonna be canceling them today if we vote for this. Mayor, Councilman Waring, Yes, that would be correct. We would have to contact uh, the organizations to notify their teams that the tournaments would be canceled. And these are fields that we own and control, correct? Mayor, Councilman, yes, that is correct. So basically we invited out of state visitors for whom our economy really relies to come to this, to come to our facilities. We rented it to them, we took their money um, they presumably purchased hotel flight, purchased, you know, hotel rooms and flights, probably spent quite a bit of money. I went through this myself in the spring. I had a trip planned that I didn't wind up taking and 
who knows we get that money back and so forth so so they've invested a lot of their capital some of them are probably wealthy and can absorb the hit but you know most probably aren't um and now we're canceling their event could they sue us these groups mayor councilman um i i will defer to law in terms of um legality but what i can tell you is that um if they so the tournament organizers actually reserve the fields versus us reaching out to the independent teams. We do require a deposit, but we would fully refund um, if the fields are, are not used. And then also in our facility use agreement, we do have language that talks about the ability to cancel in an emergency during unsafe conditions. Okay, fair enough. Um, to say the least, we're probably costing a lot of people a lot of money and they're probably going to be confused to get this news because their flight is still flying. Their hotel room is still available because nobody's shut down the flights and we haven't closed the hotels. The restaurants that they would be going to are still going to be open. So I guess if I was them, I might be like, well, heck, I'm still coming. And they're still going to be mingling with our population, still going to be traveling through the airport, still going to be going to the hotels. Um, I'm not a hundred percent on what we're accomplishing here. Uh, and I don't mean this unkindly and I'm not saying this stuff shouldn't be happening. And I shouldn't say this as a, in a way that uh, would paint any of the leagues or anything in a bad light or the universities. But they're probably going to be doubly confused when they turn on ESPN in whatever state it is they're coming from. And they say that we've actually invited a team from out of state, a professional football team, to come to Maricopa County, not Phoenix, but Maricopa County, play in a government-sponsored facility, taxpayer-funded facility, practice probably in some taxpayer-funded community college or something for several weeks, and then another team is flying in to play those same guys on Sunday in the uh, Glendale Stadium. And then professional basketball is starting up in a couple of weeks. And both Arizona universities have sent teams to California to play games in the last month. But we're canceling their activity. I'm not sure if one of those people contacted me what I would tell them I'm not sure what I'd tell them in that circumstance. I, I, I have no idea what I'd tell them about how we're singling you out. You're a parent. You decide this is safe for your child. I'm not saying I would necessarily make this trip if I were them, but they're deciding to make this trip as a parent. They felt it was safe enough to do it. You heard some people testify. They said it was necessary for one reason or another in their specific personal instance. And now we're taking that away from them really at the last minute and probably costing them a boatload of money that they may or may not get back. Probably some of, I mean, that's pro that might be their uh, vacation fund for the year. Uh, so I have a hard time with just canceling this today. I understand the reasons. I'm not questioning anybody's motives. Uh, and I'm certainly not questioning the activities I mentioned. I'm just saying it's, it's an odd, it would be odd for me if I was just sitting at home watching this, wondering how this has been handled. Um, people obviously in mass, you're talking about thousands of teams. So presumably I assume tens of thousands of players who have, you know, double that parents. Uh, and many of the parents I'm sure are coming because uh, these kids are probably mostly minors. A lot of them are minors anyway. Um, I, I just don't know how that, that I just laid out is sending out a coherent message about protecting public health. Um, and and I, I just, I don't know if I can support that. I don't think I can. Um, different safety protocols and so forth that have been put in place do make sense. Somebody mentioned, you know, posting uh, the, uh, you know, how you're supposed to behave and so forth. But I, I don't know, given what I just laid out, how I could reach a conclusion that what we're doing is really helping a whole lot given that these people could all still come and they could do all the activities uh except i guess playing in the game 
And I'm not sure since we're allowing lots of other games, I'm not sure why that makes sense. So, I mean, I appreciate everybody's efforts. I, I understand what, what people are saying. I did want to comment also, you know, Reach 11 is a big facility. Uh, it's in the district I represent, District 2. Um, if you look at the statistics, Councilman Garcia mentioned this, you know, the, the virus is terrible everywhere. But in District 2, there have been about, I'm doing this from memory, about 6,500 cases uh, last time I checked, which I think was last night. You know, there are about 8,000 each in Districts 2 and District 3, and the, our three districts are all basically north of northern. And as you go further south in the city, you about you just about double the 6,000. You got about 11, 12,000 in the districts to the south, and then District 7, I think it is, has about 15,000 cases. So it's definitely affecting different areas uh, not equally. And so... You know, I do have to suspect that at some point people are following more protocols or something. I don't know how to explain it. Nobody's been able, I've asked people and nobody seems to know why it would be so different um, in the one particular district, which happens to be the one I represent. But I, I feel confident that winter visitors would come and abide by the rules. Um, I did hear, uh, I think it was Councilman Pastor talk about parks and so forth and people wearing masks. So, you know, I'm out walking around to take walks instead of going to the gym because I haven't been going to the gym. And, and I see lots of people. And if they're not wearing masks because we're at a distance, pretty much everybody puts on a mask, you know, when they get fairly close by and everybody passes and kind of waves and then that's it. Or we steer clear of each other. One of the two. There's usually enough space to do that safely. Um, I don't know what it's like elsewhere because I'm just not getting out as much because of the virus. There aren't nearly as many places you would go. But I, I would say that, you know, I, I do think, at least as far as Reach 11 goes, I'd like to think people could come, behave in a responsible manner. I'm not saying anybody else isn't. I'm just saying, you know, in that one particular area. And, uh, you know, and really not have their, their whole trip ruined, frankly, their whole year ruined. This might be the one fun thing that they're doing. And I don't know that by canceling it, we've really made anybody safer. So I just wanted to put those thoughts out there. I appreciate you guys hearing me out. Uh, and again, I'm not saying anybody else is wrong. I just wanted to speak my piece. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman Waring. Any additional council member comments? Mayor, I'd just like to see if I can have an answer on that from the amendment about a weekly re report on co from our COVID-19 experts on our city parks. I mean, I, I, I'm I, sorry, Mayor. Sorry. I go ahead, Vice Mayor. I, th I think it's definitely a question to you. And then after that, we'll go to Councilwoman Stark, who had raised her hands. But go ahead, Vice Mayor. Okay, I, I think that um, Council Member Nokowski, I think you're getting um, to something really, really good here, um, which is something that um, we've been pushing um, for for a while. And I think um, I, I think that's a, I, I think that's more something that we can deal with at policy next week in terms of because I think you're right. I think we have to deal with the airport. We need to deal with the parks, I think having a weekly report sounds like a good idea. I just don't see how that fits into the motion, but I but I thought that Ed was coming back um, and giving us a, a full report and trying to figure out how do we actually get that weekly um that weekly that weekly report that includes the airport and I think it includes everything, right? Because pretty soon we're gonna be getting we're gonna start getting asked about about libraries, about community centers, about different things. So I just think that we should maybe have like a, a, a broader conversation about that in policy. I agree, but I was just asking about the parks only uh, weekly report because we don't have an a end date and the end date's gonna be based on the experts, based on numbers, based on data. So I'd like to get that data so then if people are asking us, when are we going to open up the parks? 
I can turn around and say, well, the data says A, B, and C. So just the parks, not the rest of it. And in the future, I agree, we should talk about everything. Uh, yeah, okay, I so just Council don't, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Councilman, you're just looking for a weekly update as to whether or not we have hit this, the triggering metric, which would be the September levels? Correct, uh-huh. Okay, yeah. I guess to me that that would make sense. If I, I thought you were looking for every week for new policy recommendations and. No, in the okay. future, that's what I would like to see, but for oh. this one, just the parks. Mayor, I don't know that that needs to be in the motion because that would be uh, a, something we would do as a management response to the motion itself would be to communicate regularly, weekly, the data that is um, that the vice mayor's motion sets in place about how how we compare to September 6th. So if it's sufficient to the councilman, um, I'm planning to do that as a follow-up to this if this motion passes anyway. Okay, thank you. But I think that Councilman Nowakowski raises an important point. We need to communicate with folks that this the triggers are based on public health and not a date. There was a, mo a motion or suggestion in the packet that it be based on a date, but we have, assuming this motion passes, decided to do it based on public health levels, which I think is wise and, and follows the recommendations of our consultant. And we should explain to our community we are doing it based on the prevalence of the virus. We are at a tough time yeah. in our country right now. Today, the Senators for Centers for Disease Control Director Redfield testified that he is expecting over the next few months to have the worst time of public health experience in our country in, in, in our lifetimes, that we have rough months ahead because of the impact of COVID-19 on our healthcare system. And we just heard local testimony to that same point that we have seen a huge increase in the stress on our healthcare system. Uh, I've never seen or heard from so many doctors about an item, but many wrote in to us saying they really wanted us to take this item seriously. The healthcare system is stressed and this is contributing to it. We had important testimony from the leader of the hospital and healthcare association for our state saying that bars, restaurants, and these sporting events were the top three to the extent we know contributors to COVID-19 that we can control. And we know people who go to these sports events have families, including grandparents who are very vulnerable. Um, several people did acknowledge today we have imperfect data right now. Right now, uh, the city does not require tournaments or anyone participating to report COVID numbers to us. We also have imperfect numbers in our schools. Right now, we are students are not required to report to their schools or do contract tracing. And so we have to make data-based decisions with the data we have. And we, we have to listen to our healthcare and hospital associations when they say, this is an important step you can take towards reducing the spread of COVID-19. It is one of many the city takes today. On our consent agenda, we approved additional investments in testing. We also approved additional investments in cleaning. So we are, we are looking at this problem from many different lenses. The city council, again, took unanimous steps on several items today to do more to fight COVID-19. Just in the item before, we've invested in more consulting help to help us with the many decisions that are before us. This is not, not our last difficult decision during COVID-19. And we're gonna keep trying to do the best we can for our community to help us get through this. The good news is that vaccine results are very promising. The light is at the end of the tunnel. The governor has said vaccine distribution will begin in Arizona this month. So we know there are better days ahead, but we may have very, very difficult times before we get there. We are making the best decision we can today. We know it is a very difficult time to be a kid, to be a parent, to be a grandparent. And there's um, a tough times for everyone in this community. The city will try to do our best to balance and to listen and to find innovative solutions to difficult problems. So we appreciate everyone who's participated in this important debate. We've heard heartfelt testimony on both sides and we are gonna continue to, to try to listen and make the best decisions that we can. Thank you for, for being part of this important conversation. So Mayor, I, I just, just to... thank you. Just very quickly, um, 
other cities, and I guess this is to uh, to Tracy, other cities around the county have soccer fields, activity fields as well, correct? Mayor, Councilwoman, yes, that is correct. And so do we know if any of other cities or towns in the county are doing what we're doing? And I'm not judging other cities and towns, mind you. I'm just curious if anyone else has taken any actions to close down tournaments. Mayor, Councilwoman, yes, there are some cities that have taken steps to close down tournaments, uh, such as Surprise, uh, Goodyear does not, uh, does not, is not hosting tournaments, nor is Tempe. Sorry, I'm going through a, a sheet. <laughs> Tucson, Buckeye, um, have all uh, canceled tournaments. And am I missing any? I, I believe those are the ones that um, all of the ones that have uh, canceled or or were not did not reinstate tournament play. Okay, thank you. So this is happening elsewhere in in the county in the in the state of Arizona, and and I do uh, agree with the mayor. This is just unprecedented times in my lifetime. And I, believe me, I'm older than most on council. I've never seen anything like this. And and we do have to take this seriously. Our hospitals are near capacity. I too got letters from um, several doctors saying this is the worst of the worst. We need to combat this pandemic. And this is how the city of Phoenix can help. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any final comments from council members? Councilwoman Pastor. Sorry. Um, I, at first, I was just uh, earlier wanting to comment about uh, Councilman Nowakowski's uh, request that I, uh, I that was part of uh, item 28 to not very specifically to the parks, but to have uh, that type of data for all our areas. And so I just wanted to make that comment, uh, but I also feel um, for those that have the young kids uh, or kids just in general that are online and virtual and need a, an outlet uh, to do things because I have those two kids in my house and I understand the mental challenges or the mental health issues that are coming about because I'm seeing it within my own kids. And it is a struggle, it is a push pull me that we're we're all in, in within our own family. And I would just say within our own selves of the push pull me of the stress that we're facing, um, trying to uh, maintain uh, a life as, as in the past, but really being locked up, not locked up, but really being um, at our house, uh, trying to work, trying to maintain the lifestyle that we have or normalcy for our kids and for our family. And in doing that, it, it becomes very stressful for everyone. Um, and we all need outlets uh, to, to relieve the stress. So I understand um, those parents that have uh, kids in club ball, because I have kids in club ball. Um, I understand also the need to uh, as elected official to follow the science and look at the science and make a decision for a larger collective and the, for the greater good of our community. And I have sympathy all the way around in this whole process. And we just need to understand at this moment, it's the science that is leading us to the decisions that we're making um, due to the fact that I don't want to lose any more lives. I also don't want uh, the spread to continue. I want it to the vaccine to come out sooner or faster so that then we can um, move forward uh, as, as in our future. I also don't want to, there's an economic impact that's happening right now. And, and how do we go and, and, and balance all of the, all, all of the pieces uh, in doing this. And so uh, I hear and I hear all the concerns, uh, but in me making the decision, it's really about the greater good of our community 
and staying alive. Um, so please remember to mask up, always uh, sanitize your hands, wash your hands for 20 seconds, and please stay six feet apart. Thank you. Well said, Councilwoman, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I myself, I have two young children. I have a four-year-old, I have a nine-year-old. Um, they're both cooped up at home, like they run around the backyard. Um, they try to release the stress that they have. I, I, I get it. I have sympathy for, for everyone, for all the teens, for everyone that was planning to come here. I, I totally understand it. I've had my kids in sports. I hopefully one day I'll be able to get them back into sports, which is, which is incredibly important. But then I also, you know, feel uh, for all of our essential workers and, um, and, and I'm not talking about our first responders that are essential workers. I'm talking about all the, all the workers that cannot do their jobs through Zoom, right? All those workers that have to go out every single day um, because they have to provide for their families. Right, all those families that cannot live on two hundred and forty dollars a week, um, you know, when you know there's a, a lot of uncertainty. I think that you know there's a lot of leadership um, that I think we could receive um, from the state um, that we just don't have right now, and I think that's part of the the. I think that has that's going to have to do that has to do a lot with the confusion. Right, we've. I know um, Con Councilman um, Waring was talking about the confusion that's going to cause um, with the different teams on why they can do it in one city and not with the other. And I, and I think that's that's. I don't think that's our fault. I think that has that's because of the state, because of the lack of leadership there. Um, that no one is taking reins of the whole state and saying, okay, this is what we're doing. And I think we're all then left to making our own decisions. And I think as a city. Um, we're trying to do the best thing that we can. I, I think that this virus is going to get worse in the next couple of weeks, unfortunately. Like, I've gotten calls every other day about someone that just died from COVID. Every other day I'm getting a phone call. I feel for a lot of my friends that have lost father-in-laws, that have lost nephews, that have lost a lot of family members. It's, you know, it, it, we're living in a very tragic very tragic moment. And I think we we as a city, like we're trying to do the best that we can um, to, um, I know it, it's harsh to say it, but to keep those beds open for the people that are really going to need them. And if we can avoid a group of people from catching COVID, I think that we have to do it. Um, I think um, Council Member Jim Waring said it best, you know, West Phoenix and South Phoenix have the worst cases. Of, of COVID and, and we have to figure out how is it that we can protect those people, right? It's it's a huge number, it's night and day. And again, I, I think it's because people cannot cook through Zoom, they cannot clean rooms through Zoom, they cannot clean through Zoom and they have to get out there and provide for their families. And and I think it's, and, and, I, and I'm very proud of, of the decision um, that we're actually making today and at least you know, tonight I'll be able to go to sleep at night with a clean conscience, knowing that we did the best that we could today as a council. So I just want to thank my colleagues and the mayor and everyone um, that's helping um, making this happen. Parks Department, kudos to you for everything that you guys do. Um, Ed and Inger, Tracy, everyone on that team, thank you so much for your leadership and everything that you guys do every day. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right, we will go to roll call on the Vice Mayor's motion. Cicicio. Cicicio. I really and firmly believe that kids need to be in school and on the playground. This is nothing more than a knee-jerk reaction that's going to hurt our kids. We've heard people talk about leadership. We have not seen one bold move, not one bold move coming from the leadership of the city of Phoenix. They believe, if individuals believe that COVID is real, which I do, and it's serious, which I do, but you've not seen one bold move come from anybody here. We've seen, a, we've seen our leadership attack the state of Arizona, but not take one move that takes political courage 
and bravery on their own part to do something. If you look around the country, you'll see mayors and governors across the country taking bold moves because they believe in what they're doing. So it's easy to talk it, it's harder to do things. So from my end of it, if the city of Phoenix was serious about it, we have no real plan protecting the entire general public, not one. The public needs to know that. There is no plan to protect the general public from city of Phoenix leadership, not one. And you've not seen any moves come from the city of Phoenix. So to Councilman Waring's point, it's easy to target kids. It's harder to do things that make, you have to make tough decisions and take political courage. I vote no, Mayor. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Castor? Yes. Dark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Mayor, I want to say I was one that really pushed to open the park. Uh, I thought we did the right thing. And I am very concerned that we don't have a firmer date when we can reopen because I believe it's a very healthy situation for families and kids. But I think this is the right move for now. We are in a crisis situation. Hospitals are filling. And I think we need to do something. So I will be a yes. Guardado? Yes. There you go. Yes. Passes 7-2. Thank you. Thank you to our healthcare providers for the important work you are doing out there. Hopefully this makes it a little bit safer in our community. We move on to item 30, which is the Phoenix Housing Plan City-Owned Land Reservation and Phasing Plan. This is an important item that continues the work we've done on the city's affordable housing plan. And I want to appreciate Appreciate everyone taking on this important issue at a time when housing is at the top of our minds and, and one of the top issues in our community. Uh, do we have a motion, Vice Mayor? Motion to approve item 30. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we have one member of the public to testify, Mr. Walt Gray. Uh, hello, Mayor. Uh, I, I'm I'd like to address 30. I've registered to speak on 30 and 31. My comments are similar on both issues. I'd like to combine my time and speak to both issues, 30 and 31. That would be it. That would be fine. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say that I think this is very, very bad uh, city policy, federal policy. Uh, it's a redevelopment of the Edison East Lake, East Lake area on the near east side. Uh, this is a depressed area. Uh, we're trying to make it look better without really providing a sustainable future for the people. Um, the people are being moved from subsidized housing or substandard housing to subsidized housing. And they're not being given an opportunity to advance their socioeconomic condition. And therefore, what we're doing is splitting up low-income people. And that sounds nice on the exterior, that you don't concentrate poverty. But you don't have to split up. Um, the political power and the political structure of low-income people by splitting them up around the city and then not uh, providing them with a sustainable way to the future. In the Deck Park instance, um, Vista, uh, there's no really good uh, job training and job placement program for people in that area and that development to uh, work in the Roosevelt rural area or anywhere generally in downtown. In the uh, case of uh, the dispersed lots, city lots all over the city, um, again, you're spreading up the people without improving their conditions and therefore keeping them 
in a disenfranchised state. Uh, I think that. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Gray, I, for your testimony. Um, we appreciate I, it. I, I have more to say, and I think that I this is, seems to be more, not quite four minutes. Uh, we are not allowing donation of time uh, at, at, during uh, COVID. I'm really, I, can I conclude my remarks? Yes, please give us your final thought. Thank you. Um, I think that the council should defer this information, this, these two matters, 30 and 31, until we have a new administration at the federal level. There's nothing new about waivers and IGAs and other kinds of mechanisms. And you can do a much better job when you appeal to the new administration. You're, this is a Democrat majority city council. You appeal to the low income. You're largely, you, uh, you have four Hispanics. This is a largely, uh, uh, there's a lot of Hispanics in this area. Thank you, Mr. And so therefore, I think you should uh, defer this until after the, uh, the swearing in the inauguration of President Biden. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, this is an item about city owned lands and associated planning. It involves uh, parcels throughout our city in multiple different council districts. It will be consistent with the community plans that have been developed for these neighborhoods, many of which are comprehensive and include visions of workforce development, access to jobs and recreational amenities. But this is saying we are continuing to move forward and look at our, our assets as a city of Phoenix to make as many housing units available. We have a goal of creating or preserving 50,000 homes by 2030, which is an ambitious goal, but important. Uh, the uh, US Census Pulse released data recently about housing insecurity, and unfortunately, our community has a, a troubling and, and higher rate of people who are concerned and likely to face eviction, particularly as the federal eviction moratoria uh, uh, expires on December 31st. So this is an important issue for us to move forward on as a council that is unanimously concerned about homelessness and housing. And so I think this is a, a good item to move forward. And I want to thank uh, the multiple city departments who have worked on this item. Any council member comments? Roll call. Tasicia. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8-0. We next move to item 31, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development vouchers for Deck Park Vista and Choice Neighborhoods update. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 31. Second. Any uh, council member comments? Roll call. Tasicio. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8-0. We next move to item 32, the Gat Gated Alley Pilot Program, out to expand grant funding eligibility. We have a motion. Motion um, to approve item 32. And I will second. <laughs> <laughs> Councilwoman Stork has worked very hard on, on gated alleys. Um, Councilwoman Pastor, do you have any comments? Yes, um, I actually pulled this one. Um, I wanted to make sure from staff that um, on the gated alley program that there was a ranking, um, or not a ranking, or a rubric uh, that would 
identify when there's money uh, with census tract neighborhoods to moderate uh, neighborhoods to high uh, income neighborhoods. I appreciate uh, Councilwoman Williams' uh, effort in advocating for her community and uh, wanting to get faded alleys over there, but I just want to make sure uh, I'm clear on what, what's being requested. Mayor and Councilwoman Pastor, uh, great question. So the intent of this item is to relax the minimum requirement that a uh, neighborhood that gets funding be in a low and moderate income area, but still can keep that as a critical criteria for evaluating who gets funded. Um, so the way this would work is if it's a you know tiebreaker and, and all uh, other things equal, the low and moderate income neighborhood would get the priority for funding um, rather than a uh, more middle income or higher income neighborhood. Okay, thank you, because I just want to make sure that uh, there's equity happening across the board, especially in those low uh, income areas that there is access. Thank you, Councilwoman. Important. We want to help as, as many people who need it help as possible. Can I please say something? This uh, Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it was quite a shock. We put out the flyer that Neighborhood Services gave us to put out to our neighborhoods. We had 12 people apply because they have a lot of action in their alleys. They require a lot of cleanup, uh, patrol, and we discovered that I didn't have a single data area in my district that would ever qualify. And these are people who work very hard. They're the police on patrol. They're heavily involved in block watch and they do cleanups all the time. And I think it's just as important that we spread that around because they are big block watch contributors. It's not a wealthy neighborhood. It's definitely a middle class, uh, but it qualifies in every other way to have a game. But they're retirees and they cannot afford to do it on their own. So I think it's important that we pass this and recognize um, that there are other ways for us to do what's right all through the city. Thank you. Mayor? Councilwoman Pastor. I just wanted to thank uh, Councilwoman Williams for advocating uh, for those neighborhoods. So I appreciate it, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Williams. A great advocate for her community and our city. Thank you. As as we have a great council who trying to get stronger neighborhoods, and this will be a great tool for our neighborhoods. Roll call. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Mayor, can I just explain my vote? Please do. So I'm going to be voting yes on this, but I truly want to thank staff, um, Alan, every everyone that has been working on this. It's been, I know it looks easier said than done, but, you know, going out there, catching these signatures, hunting, you know, hunting people down and letting them know that this is something um, that they qualify for, that they don't have to pay for. It has not has not been easy. Um, and I just want to thank everyone, Mario, everyone um, for being so patient with us and working with us and, and making this work. And yes, I think this is definitely um, going to be something that's key for our communities. Um, I know that we have tons of staff that are going to be excited not to have to go out and do that, those alley cleanups and that we're not calling them every other day with going and cleaning the same alley, I, you know, I'm going to be excited to see how much money we're actually going to save 
at the end after all of this is done. Um, so thank thank you so much to all the staff that's been involved with this. So I'm a yes. There you go. Yes. Passes eight zero. Thank you. We next move to item 33, light rail, small business financial assistance program pilot. Um, I will turn, I think, first to Councilman Nowakowski, who has the most businesses impacted. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I just want to thank all those people that participated um, with all the meetings that we had back in 2018 and 2019. We heard we heard how they were getting impacted with the um, with the light rail construction and then getting impacted by COVID-19. And I just really wanna personally thank you for your leadership and your commitment to South Phoenix businesses and also to our city manager, Ed Zerker, Mario Pandiawa, thank you, and Marcus um, Coleman and Chris Mackey for listening to the community's concern, hearing them out and creating outside the box um, programs. One of the things we heard was that people needed a place to go to. People needed a place to be heard. So what we did for the first time in the history of the light rail is created the center right on the light rail in South Phoenix. So it's, an, it's a community center, it's an office space, it's a place where people can come to get help and also to use the center for their own um, benefits also, have meetings concerning the light rail. So, you know, that was something that's outside the box. And I know that other cities are now looking at it also. And now the newest thing that we're voting on today is this small business financial assistant pilot program. Um, that's something else that's different that we've never used before. You know, and we learned from um, 19th Avenue, that extension there that we try to help out as much as possible. And one of the things that we heard from the small businesses is that they actually needed some financial help. Um, it was great for us to have a promotion, advertising their businesses through different medias and all that, but they actually needed to pay the bills. So this is where this program came about. I just really wanna thank all the leadership of the city of Phoenix, all the community mom and pop businesses that participated and brought this program to life. So I think that's what we call the Team Phoenix approach and it's something new, out of the box, and thank you all for, for your um, leadership in making this all happen. Thanks. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor, followed by Councilmember Garcia. I think Councilman Garcia goes for, I believe he Council has member Garcia. Thank you. Um, I mean, it. I think it's important to recognize that these these neighborhoods and these businesses are going through a lot. They're not only being hit by COVID, but they're obviously being hit by the construction and what's happening with, with the right light rail expansion. Um, having worked with some of the organizations even before I was on council, some of the businesses before I was on council, um, I was hoping we wouldn't get to, to a point where we're at now, which is a point where we're not sure what businesses were helping, what businesses were not. And so I, I'm, I'm supportive of this. I know we continued it from last time. I'm glad we staff was able to, to increase the amounts. Uh, thank Councilwoman Pastor. She put together a meeting with, with a group of, of businesses down um, by the light rail and Ed and Mario joined us there. I'm, I'm glad we were able to raise the amounts, um, but I, I, I think we, we can do more. And, and, and I think we have done more. And I think what we need to do is be able to package it and be able to look at each business almost on a case-by-case -case scenario and see what they qualify for and, and us being able to accompany them. Because the last thing we want is for these businesses and the culture of South Phoenix to disappear when the light rail comes. I know that may be the interest of some, maybe some of the owners of the land down there, but we gotta make sure that South Phoenix uh, preserves its identity, preserves its culture, and that the good that's coming with the light rail um, gets to those businesses. And so um, I wanna move to approve item 33. I'm glad that, the, the, that, it, that we were able to increase the amounts, um, but I wanna be able to continue to work with my colleagues and staff to find more resources for the businesses affected by the light rail construction and the pandemic. Um, we kept hearing 
you know, it's not enough and nothing's enough. Not what we're putting out there is not enough. And so grateful that we're moving this forward, but I want to be able to continue to work and, and get those businesses some more resources. Thank you. I'll second that, Mayor. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Councilwoman Pastor. Yes, I just appreciate everyone's effort uh, from Councilman Nowakowski to uh, Councilman Garcia and, and, and all my colleagues in, in being participating, uh, working on additional assistance, financial assistance on the light rail and small business program. Um, as you know, uh, as stated earlier, we do, we're facing a pandemic. These, these small businesses are facing the pandemic, but on top of that, construction of light rail. So any financial assistance uh, moves further with them. And so really appreciate all the hard work and staff's work in, in getting to where we are today. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Williams. I want to express my appreciation of Northwest Extension 2 is relatively new to the businesses along the way. Uh, I think it will be a very enlightening experience. They do not know about how South Phoenix has had to operate and readjust and suffer. So I appreciate all that you've done to include the Northwest Extension so we can get that light rail across the freeway in the Metro Center. I just want to staff, uh, thank staff and all those involved, the council members involved, for taking the lead on this and make it happen. So thank you all. Uh, well said, Councilman Williams. We think there are approximately 145 businesses in the South Central corridor and 60 businesses in the Northwest Extension 2 corridor that will be impacted by this, but it's Certainly our hope to watch this program and, and if it's successful as we move forward with cap by 10 and other extensions to to learn and, and to do what we can to best support our amazing small businesses. We do have members of the public here to comment. We have, I believe, three members of the public, but I will um, ask staff to make sure I have the most updated list. Um, so we will begin with Walt Gray, followed by Sal Reza, followed by Sylvia Herrera. Um, I just want to say, I thank you, Mayor. I just want to say that I think this is a, a good move by the city uh, to do this uh, for small business that are going to be greatly impacted. I think, as I already mentioned, this is far too little money uh, for the impact of light rail construction. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's a pilot project. It's uh, it's good to test it out, see if it works or if it needs more money or test it out as if it, you know, can adjust it for more money and then apply it to uh, depressed areas in the inner city. Um, you know, and I live in West Phoenix and I think area uh, zip code 85031 and 85009. Uh, this is um, East. It's between 43rd Avenue and I-17. It's more depressed than the rest of West Phoenix. I think that kind of a program in West Phoenix would be good in depressed areas. I think we have the same kind of areas in South Phoenix, in East Phoenix, and in North Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Reza followed by Sylvia Herrera. Can you hear me? Hello? We can. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, yes. Uh, now my name is Salvador Reza, and I've been working with the business community there prior to the to the light rail construction and all the way down to now. And one of the things is that uh, we knew it was going to happen. We knew the destruction was coming. But... Uh, Hopefully, the city of Phoenix will learn from this and learn from LA and learn from several Washington and other places that did, did take care of their business community. But at the same time, right now, 
uh, the business uh, people there basically are going out of business. Some people have lost over 60% of the business, some 30%, some 40%. And uh, it's something that uh, is really affecting them uh, tremendously. Uh, they will accept any money right now. And $9,000 hopefully would be enough to to pay taxes because uh, that's another thing that the city could do is probably find a exempt them from taxes. Also water and other utilities, which uh, hasn't happened. Uh, so uh, I urge the city not to stop right here, but to continue. And that uh, for next year, uh, you have time, actually come up with more money because uh, $9,000 to be able to survive uh, even one year is, is too little for the destruction that, they ha that the, 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 the light rail has caused for them. So. Uh, Thank you for um, you know for uh, considering and hopefully uh, uh, this will be the beginning of actually working with a, with a, with the light rail uh, uh, business community affected in such a terrible way. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go to Sylvia, I believe uh, Councilman Nowakowski will turn to. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Mayor, I just want to thank uh, Lord for all his um, advocacy and all his work with the small businesses out there in South Phoenix. Uh, just continue doing that, Salvador. One of the things is that we're working along with Mario and Marcus and Chris Mackey to try to find some extra money for those businesses that are out there. And also thank you, um, Council Member Williams, for your advocacy. I forgot to add you to that list of extending the light rail all the way up to Metro Center. Hello? Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. This is Dr. Herrera, and I would make brief remarks on based on years of experience working with communities throughout the valley that have been uh, affected by light rail. Communities are always impacted by light rail in at least three ways. The residents, the, small, the businesses, and the cultural integrity of the community. Today I will speak specifically about the small businesses, the mom and pop shops along South Central Avenue that have been severely impacted by the construction of light rail. Over a year ago, small businesses in South Phoenix organized as a group, and we're talking about uh, at least 30 businesses that were meeting to have their voices heard. I support the item before you and see it as a stepping stone to assure that the small businesses along South Central are not totally devastated by the disruption of the light rail construction. We hope that there will be other funds identified to offset costs that these businesses are incurring. The item before you to provide financial assistance should be seen as a reinvestment into the South Phoenix community. Uh, a community that has been neglected for decades. Nevertheless, small businesses have flourished, bringing the cultural integrity and stability to South Phoenix neighborhoods. Don't destroy and completely eliminate these businesses that are an integral part of the existing community. It is imperative that you provide this financial assistance to these businesses that are now in an economic crisis, not only due to the disruption called caused by the light rail construction, but also the restrictions and limitations that have been imposed by the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herrera. That is our final com public comment. Any final council member comments? Roll call. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 
We next move to item 35, which is the downtown shared electric scooter pilot program. Will the city clerk please read the title? Item 35 is for ordinance G6772 and ordinance amending ordinance number G6602 as amended by ordinance number G6676 to further extend the sunset date of the pilot dockless electric stand-up scooter program to December 31st, 2021. Thank you, do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 35. Second. Second. Any comments? Roll call. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Castor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Waring? Can you hear me? I can hear you now, Councilman. Oh, okay, sorry, yep, thanks. I'm sorry, can you please clarify your vote? Unmute. <laughs> are, you, are you talking to me? Yes, yeah. Councilman Waring. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-0. We move to item 42, which is an intergovernmental agreement with ADOT for safety improvements at 27th Avenue and Thomas Road Railroad crossings. Do we have a motion? Motion. motion. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I motion to approve item uh, IGA with ADOT for safety improvements at 27th Avenue and Thomas Road. Railroad crossing. Um, I would like uh, an update on this. Second. Second. Mayor, members of the council, Councilwoman Pastor, uh, this uh, project is includes not one but two railroad crossings at the intersection of 27th Avenue and Thomas Road. Uh, we've been under design for a, a number of years on this project because of the close coordination we've had with ADOT, the Arizona Corporation Commission, BNSF Railroad, and uh, ourselves in the city of Phoenix. So uh, we've gone, uh, undergone a number of redesigns on this to make sure that all of the parties um, to this agreement are uh, uh, happy with the design. Uh, it did increase the cost and that's why we're back here with this amendment for the project. Uh, we anticipate uh, that design will continue for about another year. Uh, we've got to be able to work on right-of-way acquisition, which is um, sometimes uh, complicated when it comes to railroad projects. Uh, and we expect to be able to start construction on the project in 2022. Keeney? Yes, Councilwoman Pastor. How does this affect uh, we're doing the 27th Avenue Thomas, and then we're doing Indian School uh, expansion. How does is this all going into play at the same time? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, members of the council, uh, we will be working through the schedule on on that. We haven't got that far, but we do have flexibility in the schedule when this goes. I know when we get to the point in design on this, when it's accepted by Federal Highways Administration and all the different parties. Uh, we have to go through the federal um, obligation approval process, so we do have some flexibility in the schedule when this goes through, but we can coordinate uh, certainly with the 35th Avenue and uh, Indian School project that's going on, and we also have our 35th Avenue corridor build grant as well. And we have the Indian School bridge. Yes. Or the free okay. I just think we need to have coordination and also uh, being able to start really, I know we have, but really start uh, talking to folks around there on what the impact is going to be. We will include that, um, Councilman Pastor, as part of our project process, as we usually do uh, in any of our other projects we have out there to make sure we're including the, the um, public as uh, we get closer to what that uh, construction phasing and schedule would look like. And, and the then impacts. The next, okay, and the next question that will be asked by me, uh, to me, will be, will there be some business assistance? Um, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, uh, we haven't got that far into there, but that uh, is, is something we don't typically do with our projects. But as it, we look at the impacts of a project like this and, and the duration of it and what impacts it might have on traffic and surrounding businesses, uh, that's something we can obviously um, have those conversations with you and also look at the impacts to see if we need to have those conversations with the business community. 
Thank you. Uh, the reason why I pulled this is because I want it on record and for uh, constituents to be able to hear this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Roll call. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes eight zero. We move to the planning and zoning portion of our agenda, our final four agendized items. The first is item 60, which is the southeast corner of 32nd Street and Southern Avenue in Councilmember Garcia's district. So we'll turn to Councilmember Garcia. Mayor, is there public comment? Uh, there, I'm sorry, there is one member of the public to uh, comment. Can we, Mr. Paul Van Buren, should we begin with him? I yeah, just didn't know if you wanted to start with a motion or public comment. We can hear from from Mr. Van Buren. That's fine. Wonderful, Mr. Van Buren. Thank you for your patience. The floor is yours. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Madam Mayor. It is a privilege to uh, be before um, all of you that have chosen to serve us. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, this is my first time at this, so uh, I just wanted to make uh, one comment um, before I get started, and that is that I'm so grateful to have had an opportunity to have listened to the entire uh, council meeting for the first time uh, I've ever done this. Uh, your dedication is inspirational. Uh, the fact that you've continued to work uh, through this pandemic in such a way is also inspirational, and I just wanted to reach out and thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, that my story today, um, if you don't mind, I don't want to veer off too far, but um, I started driving uh, for Uber at the beginning of the pandemic um, to help our essential workers. And I have some comments on that if you'd like to hear them as, as to the future uh, of uh, the statistics that will be coming out and how people have responded and the things that I, I see day to day in, in terms of what's being on the ground. but. <clears throat> Truly, we have a, a number of people now that are um, are uh, not still being compliant uh, like they should be due to the fact that they believe, um, you know, um, a cure is on the way and a vaccine is, is preeminent. And Mr. Uh, within Mr. Weeks or months. If, if you could leave, uh, focus your comments on the agendized item and then we have general public comment. Oh, You're yeah. welcome to address the council on any other oh, okay. items. Thank you. I know it's a complicated system, but we try to stick on one agenda item at a time. Okay, absolutely. Thank you so much, and, and, and I do appreciate it. Yeah, my, my story actually has to do with a vaccine as well. We've lived in this property uh, for 17 years, and when the applicant purchased the property adjacent, we started having scorpion issues of consequence. At that time, we had a uh, our newborn child who was um, stung multiple times in his crib. He was less than a year and a half old at that time. Um, fortunately, um, the, uh, uh, the Phoenix Hospital was doing a, a, a test with University of Arizona on a vaccine that had been, uh, been used in Mexico for 20 years, but still not approved by the FDA or we would have lost our son. Uh, I'm speaking to you today in regards to this approval for this case, because our only concern or only objection is the fact that they store a huge amount of waste on site uh, unlike they don't do it uh, any, anywhere near to what the competitors, their competitors do. And it's, it's caused a number of problems. We really don't have much recourse unless we go to the county. Um, the county, from what I understand, has been called uh, multiple times. Um, and we have also uh, sent information to uh, all the council members of recent. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to thank uh, Carlos for coming out the other day. I appreciate it. He's a, a wonderful person. And I do know that the uh, that the uh, subdivision adjacent is in favor of this. They're they're kind of concerned. They're uh, living in somewhat a fear situation due to the fact that that they believe uh, they've been led to believe that that I'm totally against the landscaping company uh, being there, and they don't want them to move because they're fearful that 
potentially a subdivision could come in with a number of houses. I am all for the landscaping companies. Uh, just this one in particular stores uh, several hundred thousand uh, tons uh, or several thousand tons of, of rubbish on their property. It's created a, a number of problems and issues for us. And I just wanted to thank you again for giving me extended time. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Van Buren. I think uh, Councilmember Garcia has been working very hard on this, but um, we continue to look at our fire code and we want to make sure that, that everyone is safe. So this, this case is not the only avenue on, on that public safety element. Um, that is our final public comment. So I will turn back to Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank Paul. I, I was able to go out to the property yesterday and speak to some of the other neighbors. Um, I believe the, the PUD actually brings a little bit more regulation um, to the situation the way it is now. Um, you know, it brings some setbacks, some hedges for the neighbors. Uh, this company's been, ELS has been in the, in, in the site for a while now. Um, and I hope that they can make these changes and, and continue to be uh, good neighbors. So with that, I will motion to approve item 60. Um, Second. Second. Any additional comment? Roll call. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Castor. Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8-0. Items 62 and 63 are related items uh, concerning the southeast corner of 101st Avenue and Southern Avenue, so we will hold one public hearing for both items. We will begin with the staff report. I will open the public hearing. We will take comment and then I will turn to Councilman Nowakowski for a motion. Uh, Alan Stevenson, our planning and development director will introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Uh, this item, as you stated, is a companion general plan amendment and zoning case. We'll just need separate motions uh, at the end uh, here. So item 62 is a general plan amendment for the southeast corner of 107th Avenue and Southern, and item 63 is the corresponding rezoning case. Uh, in this case, the general plan request is to go from existing residential one to two dwelling units per acre. In parks open space, the applicant requested uh, residential 3.5 to five dwelling units per acre. The acreage is uh, almost 70 acres. Staff does recommend denial as filed and approval of residential two to 3.5 dwelling units per acre, and that's what's before the council uh, today. This shows the corresponding general plan land use designation of the, the yellow and green area. This is showing it all to uh, yellow uh, residential, two to 3.5 dwelling units per acre. The Australia Village Planning Committee did recommend approval of the general plan by a four to three vote. The Planning Commission recommended approval by an eight to zero vote. On the related zoning case, uh, the existing zoning is S1 and uh, RE43. Uh, the request is to go to R110, single-family residential, for uh, almost 66 acres. It is for a proposed single-family uh, residential subdivision. Staff does recommend approval per the memo uh, dated November 24, 2020, uh, from myself. Uh, here you see the subject site uh, in detail here. This is the map showing the existing zoning uh, as it is in the area and surrounding context. This is the proposed uh, site plan for the project, which is a mix of residential product types with lot ranges uh, from uh, 45 foot wide lots up to 65 foot wide lots throughout the, uh, the proposed project. The staff does, uh, the Australia Village Planning Committee recommended approval by a seven to zero vote. The Planning Commission recommended approval uh, per the Australia Village Planning Committee with uh, some modified stipulations. Uh, the, one of those modified stipulations was to uh, allow additional residential density to go from uh, 203 lots to 279 lots uh, as part of their proposal. Uh, that uh, is the matter that's before the, plan the council today from the Planning Commission that is outlined in the November 24th, 2020 uh, memo. So staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission and adoption of the related ordinance for 
the zoning case, item 63, and then item 62 is approval per the Planning Commission adoption of the related resolution. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any council questions for our planning director? All right. I will open the public hearing. Uh, we have um, only one person to speak, and that is the applicant, uh, only if necessary. Uh, so I guess, do any council members have any questions? I will close the public hearing and turn to Councilman Nowakowski for a motion on item 62. Mayor, a motion to approve per the um, Planning Commission approval of the adoption of related ordinance. It will be resolution. I'll second it. Second. I mean, item seven is a resolution as opposed to an ordinance because it's a general plan. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody was a planning director before. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. Thank you all for that collaborative teamwork. Uh, it's an exciting part of our city. The Rio reimagined corridor is certainly important to me and so many of us of the council. So I would urge the applicant to be active participant in that planning effort. And um, with that, uh, any additional public comment before we vote on 62? Roll call. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8 0. Eight zero. We move to a related item, item 63, Councilman Nowakowski. Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. I'm sorry, Mayor. So motion to approve per the Planning Commission's approval and adopt related ordinance. Second. Mayor, Mayor members of council, the, the zoning case should be motion to approve uh, per the memo from the Planning Development Director dated November 24th, uh, 2020 and adopt the related ordinance. All right, sorry about that. I had to switch with the um, 60, 62. That's exactly what I wanted to say, Mayor. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Uh, that's the Team Phoenix approach. Any comments? <laughs> <laughs> A different type of Team Phoenix, not how Councilman Nowakowski always uses it. Roll call. <laughs> Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-0. We move to our a final agendized item, item 64, which is off-premise signs for schools, uh, a text amendment process that um, some very fit patient applicants have been working on for a long time. We will begin with a staff report, and then we will open a public hearing. We have only two comments. The um, folks who are supporting it, and then we will go to a motion. Council, uh, Planning Director Alan Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. This is a privately filed text amendment by the Crichton Elementary School uh, Community Foundation to support the foundation and the school district so that uh, they can uh, get additional revenue to help with after school programs and other uh, programs for the unique situations that are within uh, that uh, public school district. Uh, one of the things I want to point out with this is it does require a property specific PUD. So what you are, are voting on uh, here today, if approved, just sets up the ordinance to allow it to happen within the city, but any specific site would have to come through and be rezoned through a PUD process that the mayor and council would vote on. So this does not grant any automatic entitlements through this uh, text amendment process. It is uh, the, uh, the current standards for a off-premise sign uh, are that has to be within a PUD zone property. 
uh, or A1 or A2 along a permitted uh, freeway within that 300 feet and a minimum of 20 uh, gross acres and no part of any off-premise sign can be closer than 500 feet from a residential district and residential use. Uh, the text amendment is proposing to allow for a PUD uh, zoning district to be used for a, on a property that's a minimum of 15 gross acres that's located on a publicly owned uh, 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 parcel and also used for a school and within 300 feet of a permitted freeway. It also does reduce that setback requirement to 250 feet from residentially zoned property given the location of, of where schools are, but this would allow for a, uh, a publicly uh, owned school that's on publicly owned land to come forward, apply for a PUD uh, if they're meeting the other criteria of minimum 15 gross acres along our permitted freeway to uh, go through zoning process to allow for off-premise advertising. It was approved by uh, 12 village planning committees, uh, approved by the planning commission, and also approved uh, by the land use and livability subcommittee back in uh, May timeframe of uh, this last year. Uh, with that, staff, da staff does recommend approval for the land use and livability subcommittee recommendation, adoption of the related ordinance. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Councilwoman Pastor? Um, Alan, does this add more billboards to the freeway, or what exactly is it doing? So, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, it would allow for a, uh, a school district to file a separate uh, zoning case on behalf of a school if it was located along a, a permitted freeway and met those other criteria to um, then go forward and that school district uh, would probably have a RFP process or something to then allow for a billboard company to, to locate a billboard on that site. Um, and so it would allow for additional billboards in the city, but under a, a very narrow criteria because of the, the standards that you have to meet in terms of being a, a public school on 15 acres of publicly owned land uh, along a permitted freeway. So you've got to meet all those uh, criteria and then you would could propose it, but ultimately the council gets to decide whether or not that PUD with that use is appropriate on any specific site. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. We have Jeff Bowles followed by Michael Merowitz. They are the only two registered to speak. I'm sorry, Jeff. Uh, we do not have a good connection. Are, are others struggling here, Jeff? Yes. Uh, y yes. Okay. Why don't we go first to Michael and then we'll try Jeff again. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, member of the City Council for your records. Uh, my name is Mike Merowitz with the law firm of Gamage and Burnham at 40 North Central Avenue here in Phoenix. Uh, I am here on behalf of the applicants for this text amendment, the Creighton School District and the Creighton Community Foundation. I know Jeff had some technical difficulty, but um, I'm, I'm sure he is fine. I think the intent was for me to give uh, a short presentation. Um, thank you, Alan, for, for the great presentation. Uh, this text amendment has been a multiple year long process, and we want to thank the council and staff for their hard work and help in getting this text amendment to this point. Uh, as the, the mayor had noted, a citywide text amendment is typically a very long public process with lots of opportunities for community feedback at public hearings. And that's certainly been the case for this text amendment. Uh, we filed the formal application for this text amendment in April of 2019. And since this time, we've had just shy of 30 uh, hearings. Uh, we presented this text amendment to 12 different village planning committees for both an informational session and again for recommendation uh, to the planning commission for an informational session and again for recommendation 
and then also to the city council land use and livability subcommittee. Uh, as Alan noted, we received a favorable recommendation of approval at each of these public hearings with many of those recommendations being unanimous. And so over a year and a half after filing the form application and, and 27 hearings later, we are very excited to be at the finish line and ask for the council's approval of this text amendment. Uh, we strongly believe this text amendment will have a tremendous impact on, on the lives of many students and families, uh, particularly those within the Creighton School District. Uh, I, I do have a formal presentation, but in the interest of everyone's time, I know this has been a very long meeting. Uh, so unless the council would like me to provide a formal presentation, I, I will stop here and say that we respectfully request your approval of this text amendment and we're happy to answer any questions the council has. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. An enormous amount of work. And, and Jeff, we are so sorry that we could not hear you. Um, we know how hard you've worked on this. I will, if I don't, if we don't have any council member questions, I will close the public hearing. Uh, do we have a motion? Yes, um, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Um, and I know I was part of the reason why it was slowed down. I had some questions, but I think everything's been answered. So I move to approve per the land use and livability subcommittee recommendation and adopt the related ordinance. Okay. So, okay. Motion and a second. Any council member comments? Roll call. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Williams? Yes. Thank you. Guardado? Yes. There you go. Yes. Passes 8 0. Yes, 8 0. Thank you. Congratulations. That is our final agendized item of this council meeting. We do have one member of the public to address the council. I will turn to our city attorney to introduce public comment. Thank you, Mayor. During citizen comment, members of the public may address the city council for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the city council to listen to the comments, but prohibits council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you. Uh, Marcus, the floor is yours. Um, so I just wanted to preface what I'm going to say with uh, um, kind of what Council, Council, Councilman Garcia said earlier. Um, I just really, um, I wanted to speak on my perception of a much needed public health department in the city. Um, I kind of think the CCO is right. We need to base uh, our opinions of our public health decisions on real local data. Um, I think this would be an excellent way to do it. Um, the department would better prepare us for not only protecting us from disease, they're also instrumental in promoting healthy lifestyles, uh, also researching any local disease and injury prevention. Um, kind of living in the state and uh, living in the county, um, when there's opinions all over the place, it's kind of hard to make decisions and be solid on, you know, where and when we should go. And I think um, coming from our uh, but, you know, direction and everything coming from our city, especially based on public health, uh, would, um, you know, work better. Um, what is more is we have and we are attracting some of the best schools to train future health professionals. Um, this provides opportunities for uh, less brain drain um, if they can come here and do research projects that really affect us. Uh, most importantly, it allows us to have experts that can tell us who, what, when, where, and most importantly, how to improve our health st health statistics. Um, you know, just kind of trying to make, um, you know, Phoenix more of a blue zone so people have a higher uh, life expectancy than some of the cities that uh, try to compete with us. Um, and lastly, lastly, our local health department would be best suited to make sure we have an, an, equitable, an equitable deployment of the uh, infant vaccine uh, because the information on who, when, and what is going to get that is kind of even uh, coming through differently from the federal level to the state level to the county level. 
so our local uh, if we had a local public health department, they could, um, you know, kind of deploy that in a better way. Um, so that concludes my co comments and I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The December 2nd City Council meeting is adjourned.